begin our meetings. We're recording, please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, it's June 17th, 2024, and we are beginning with a regular meeting of the town council. And as I will explain later, we're then going to take a pause in that meeting due to public forums and then come back to the meeting, okay? We'll show you the schedule in a moment. Um, the open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom and by phone, and we are checking on Amherst Media Live broadcast. There are, in fact, 10, ten counselors in the room tonight. Thank you. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the June 17th, 2024 regular town council meeting to order at 6.03. Um, I'll call upon each counselor by name, uh, by the name they have indicated they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present, and this will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. I'll begin with Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegman. Present. Councillor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Councillor Walker. Please check the audience for Council Walker. Okay. All right. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, make sure that Athena and I know, and we will decide what to do at that time. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please use the raised hand button. And uh, depending on the severity of a technical difficulty, we may have to suspend the meeting. Um, we're going to show you the schedule since it's a little different than most evenings. Uh, and so I'm asking Athena to put it up on the screen. Our first order of business, waiting, there's Amherst Media. For those of you on Amherst Media, you have not missed anything. We're just calling the meeting to order. Um, our first order of business tonight is a joint meeting with the Jones Library trustees. This is for the purpose of discussing the proposed process and timeline for filling the vacant trustee seat due to the resignation of Robert Pan. There will be no public comment during this portion of the meeting. Upon conclusion of the meeting with Jones Library Trustees, we'll recess the regular town council meeting for the purpose of holding two public forums. During each of these public forums, there will be an opportunity for public comment, but only related specifically to the topic of the public forum. The first is regarding an appropriation for the purposes of purchasing a piece of property referred to as the gauge property which is part of protecting our watershed. The second is a public forum regarding appropriations for the regional high school track and fields. At the conclusion of the second public forum, we will reconvene our regular town council meeting, starting with announcements. During the regular town council meeting, there will be one general public comment period. The order, order of the agenda is slightly changed. The discussion item regarding water and sewer updates will occur during the action items. There is no vote on the water and sewer rates tonight. That will not happen until July 15th. This requires a 14-day notice, and we need to make sure that happens for the public. The discussion of the town manager's goals, goals is postponed to June 24th, pending receipt of all informa information necessary for me to complete the analysis. At this time, I'm calling on Austin Surratt, chair of the 
Jones Library Board of Trustees to call the meeting of the trustees to order. Austin. Thank you, Lynn. I'm calling tonight's meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees to order. When I call your name, if you'd signify your presence. Uh, Farah. Here. Jean. Here. Tammy. I didn't hear Tammy, but uh, I can I can see her. Uh, I don't see Lee Edwards uh, with us. So, Lynn, we have a quorum. Thank you. The joint meeting with the library trustees for tonight is to discuss the process and timeline for filling the vacancy. The packet in the document includes five attachments. Tonight, we will only focus on A, B, C, and D. And by this, the town by doing this, the town council and the Joan, Jones Library trustees are seeking agreement on a timeline, which it is attachment B, which includes our joint meeting tonight, a joint meeting on Monday, June 24th at six for the purpose of agreeing to the questions to be asked of each candidate. And those questions will then become attachment E. We will also meet on July 15th at 6 o'clock p.m. to interview and select a candidate. The announcement regarding the vacancy that will be posted tomorrow is attachment C, and a description of the Jones Library trustees are attachment D. So I'm going to ask the town clerk, I mean the clerk of the town council, excuse me, to show the timeline and ask if there are any questions at this time regarding the timeline. And while she's doing that, let me just explain. This is a process the council has used. Now, I believe this is the fourth time. We've used it twice for school committee people. We've used it once for the housing authority. And this is the first time we've ever used it for the trustees. Um, so it's a process that is consistent with the charter and consistent with our rules of procedure and consistent, if you will, with our practice. And we're on to the next slide after this one. And, and we're on to the next one. We're actually on to the timeline for the actual trustee selection. So meantime, you've had this packet for a while and I'm looking to see if there are any hands. Just on the timeline? Regarding the timeline. Austin, you have your hand up. Uh, Lynn, the Timeline question that I have asked involves the submission of possible questions. Yes. I believe that th that is imagined to happen by the 20th of June. And my question is just, do you want these qu the potential questions to come from individual members or do you want them to come from uh, the entire, let's say the Jones Library members? Do you want, do you want them to come from individual trustees or do you want them to come from the trustees uh, as a whole. If you have a meeting at which you can discuss them uh, and you would like to submit your questions as a whole, that would be fine. Uh, the reason we need to do this in by next week is because we then don't have a council meeting until the 15th of yeah. July. Yeah. So I don't think we, we have a, a trustees meeting between now and the 20th when you had a put up the questions would be due. So we would uh, intend to submit questions individu as uh, individuals. Yes, that's necessary in order not to break up a meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the question on was on the timeline and the process. Now let's move, if you will, to the announcement, which is very important because we need because we need to post this tomorrow. I, we need to make a live link where it says Jones Library Trustees. But just take a moment to review this announcement and see if there are any changes that people would like to make at this time.
scrolling to the bottom of the announcement. Uh, no, I think you stay on the bottom. Right there. Thank you. Are there any questions with regard to the announcement? And we encourage all the trustees and counselors to make sure that they publicize it through their various newsletters, et cetera. Okay, with that, we're going to move on to the actual description of the Jones Library trustees. Oh, I'm sorry, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. On. My hand is for moving on. Oh, for moving on. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the description of the Jones Library trustees. And Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yes, at the bottom of page 10, so on the second page of this description, as I mentioned, I believe two weeks ago, um, this is listed as having a potential to join the town board slash committee of the audit committee, which I don't believe the town has unless we've checked it, but it's still listed there. I thank you. I have the feeling I pulled up the wrong. That was the only change, but I think I may have pulled up the wrong. Uh, so this is on attachment D, page 10, and uh, it's the, it's in the bullets and it says they would serve on the audit committee. We don't have a separate audit committee. The finance committee serve, of the town council serves as the audit committee. It's also down at the very bottom, right. number five of town boards and committees. Got it. Thank you. So I got it up above the top of it. Okay. I also note that um, these same four committees, the Jones Library Building Committee, the Jones Cap the Joint Capital Planning Committee, the Personnel Board, or the B Budget Coordinating Group should be go back and be listed in the description of the posting. Uh, and we will make sure we do that. Because right now, it said they might only serve on the budget coordinating group. So we need the other three. Okay. Mandy Jo, you still have your hand up. Okay. Looking at the description of the Jones Library Board of Trustees. Are there any further questions about the description of the Jones Library Board of Trustees? Jennifer. Well, where it says uh, providing significant input guidance and support for the expansion renovations of the Jones Library. I'm sorry, I think, is this on page nine? Right, you just, it's, uh, Athena just highlighted it. Oh, thank you. So I just guess cutting to the point is that um, is that asking for a particular position on the expansion. So I, maybe we could just rephrase, rephrase that if one had a different um, position on whether on their on expansion renovation or repairs, it, it sounds, I mean, we all know what support for the expansion people have different positions on that. So it sounds like it's reading, you have to have a particular position. It has been in here from the beginning as part of their description. Of no, the I know, I'm just... And so what you would like to say is support for the... Guidance, input, and support... Yeah, just take, I would say support, repair yeah. Repair or... Maybe not have support. I mean, I think that, yeah, it's it's a little loaded right now.
I'm going to suggest the following, provide significant guidance and input regarding repair or expansion renovation of the Jones Library. Is that acceptable? Uh, to me it is, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions, comments, suggestions? Okay, uh, Pat, did you want? No, I'm scratching my head. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, um, all right, let me just mention on the questions. Um, depends on how many candidates we have. We will make the um, candidates can either be in the room, in the town room on the 15th, or they can be on Zoom. And we've had a combination of both. When we did the school committee a couple of, about, um, I don't know, maybe less than a year ago, uh, we actually had about 12 or so candidates and they just lined up in the room and we did a whole routine where we made sure no candidate always answered the question first. And so we'll be doing something like that. We'd like to make sure that, uh, and the reason I included the role of the school committee or the questions from the school committee, it just gives you a sense of the kind of questions we're looking for. So I have asked that in the timeline that uh, all suggested interview questions uh, from the council and the trustees or in from the public need to be sent to me no later than this Thursday so that I can come up with a set that we can look at next Monday. Sarah, please unmute. Lynn, how many questions are you expecting? Here I'm seeing uh, for the school committee, it looks like it was six, seven, eight. Yeah, we had about eight. Okay. And it, it, you know, that's, that is really the maximum because mm -hmm. we usually allow two question, two minutes per question. Right. And depending on how many candidates, that can become a very lengthy evening. Okay, thank you. Kathy? Just responding to that question. Um, we narrowed down the school questions, but there were a lot of issues, as you could see, that were race specific. So more, fewer is better. You yes. know, when Lynn said a maximum, you know, to just real, because we're only allowing the responder a few minutes per question in addition to how, why they want to be in a summary. So it's not that we're trying to get more, but at least get at key things that people want to know. Are there other questions or comments? Again, I just want to go back and make sure there's no questions about any of these particular documents at this time. Eugene. I have a question. I, I was kicked off the meeting, and by the time I logged in, I'm not sure if you covered on page four, this is the process of the voting, the final bullet point. And I, I think I know what actually this means, but it 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 says board first and council first asking each their top choices. You only get one choice per voting round. Is that correct? It, there's only okay. One. Just yes. just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yes, but it's. It, let me also just add, it is the total collective vote of all of the trustees and who are seated and all of the counselors. So it's 13 plus five or 18 votes. Andy. Given the point just raised, should the uh, word choice be singular? It technically is, but I will take the S out. Okay. Any other changes people would like to see to the memo? Jennifer. 
Is there a hyperlink to what the statement of interest is? If at least like it may be different, you know, for the planning board or ZBA, it's um, a certain number of words that says clearly. We don't have a hyperlink to it. We do set a word limit and we describe um, a little bit of uh, the statement of interest shall describe why the candidate is interested in serving uh, out the remaining. I'm sorry, order. that's there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bob Hague. Um, in the case that we do not select one candidate that has a majority vote, what's the procedure beyond that? What we've usually done is then uh, narrowed it down to the top candidates and then had another round of voting. Okay. Farah. Lynn, what if there's a majority among the trustees, but not among the council? Is that is your response the same as for the last the previous question? In like, fact, it is 18 votes, and so it's a majority of 18 votes, no matter whether you're a trustee or council. Okay, thank you. Vera. Are there any other questions? I want to ask Alicia Walker if you can hear us and we can hear you. Eugene yes, I can. Has his, and Eugene has his hand up, Lynn. Thank you. Alicia? Yes, I can. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. I didn't see you before until we went to the widescreen. Eugene, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted uh, clarity. I'm trying to find in the document when I read it over the other day, I thought um, it had said of course, now that I'm rushing through it, I can't find it. It said that we would need nine votes. I'm trying to find where that is in the document, unless I was hallucinating. Um, I just wanted to clarify, we would need, the math looks like we would need 10 votes to settle on a candidate, right? If we're looking at five plus Generally, that the understanding is you'd like to get to 10 votes. And very often at the end of the voting process, we move to make a motion to appoint the person. And at that point, we're seeking to see whether or not everyone will confirm the person. Okay. Yeah. If I if I find, I could have sworn I saw that in the document, but I can't find it now. So but I just wanted to clarify that, that we would need <clears throat> the winning, um, the winning candidate would need 10 votes across both council, both the councils and the trustees. Yes. Mandy Joe. I just wonder that might have been a legacy from our last appointment where we calculated how many it would need if it's there. I don't if I don't know which one there we just did the house. I'll read through again and see if yeah. I can find it. But it might be left over from the last time we did the process where yeah. there were less people. Check for number of votes. I by the way, is also those people present and voting. So it's, if there's a if it's here on not, page seven. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's here yeah, on yeah. page seven. On page seven. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's 10. Yes. Good. Good patch. Thank you. Thanks. Point of order. It's not present in voting. It's, it's a flat of the remaining seats. And there are 18 remaining seats, so it's a flat 10. Okay. Whether, but you have to be present to vote. 
but just like the charter is with the council, a majority of the full town council if for certain votes where it's seven, no matter how many are present, this one is a flat 10. It's a distinction I, between got it. being Thank present you. and voting or not. So regardless of whether or not everyone votes or abstains, you need 10, you need 10 votes. affirmative votes Thank to you. select a person. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, then in that case, Austin, I'm going to ask that you adjourn the trustees. Thank you, Lynn. A uh, meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees is adjourned. And I am going to, um, at this point, uh, the meeting of the town council is in recess. That does not require a vote. Yes. Agree? Do you want to vote for that one, Athena? To, to put the meeting in recess? I don't think, I think we... you need a vote if it's more than an, uh, let me check. I don't remember if someone, um, I can take a moment to check or you can make a motion and vote. I'm just going to make a motion. I move that the council recess its regular meeting to re to reconvene after the next two public forums. So there's a second. Second. Thank you. I'm going to do a roll call vote. As soon as I... Pat DeAngelis. Hi. Anna Devon Gotham. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Ca Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Thank you. We're going to now move to the public forum on the uh, appropriation regarding the gauge property. There will be a brief presentation and then the floor will be open for questions or comments from the audience regarding this um, particular property. And um, at that point, we will then adjourn this public forum and move on to the next public forum, which is regarding the high school regional high school track and field. So, um, Paul. Um, point of order, Bob, would you like to call the finance committee to order? All right, thank you. Bob, please call the finance committee to order. Um. I'm calling the finance committee to order at 6.31 p.m. I see all five council members are present and Matt Holloway, one of the resident members is present. Matt, can you hear us and can you be heard? I'm here, Bob. Thank you. Okay, we're we're in session. Uh, Bob, here as well. I'm, I'm, I'm here oh, as Bernie. well. All right, sorry, I missed you, Bernie. <laughs> that, that's okay. Okay, given that we have a form of the council president, I'm calling the public forum regarding the gauge property to order at 632. Uh, I will quickly go through the roll. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devon Gothier. Present. Councilor Etta. Present. Lynn Griesman. is present. Councilor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councilor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Councilor Walker. Here. Okay. With that, I'm going to um, turn this over to Paul, and I, you can tell me who you would like to call on for a brief presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lynn. Uh, Superintendent Public Works, Guilford Boring, is going to make a brief presentation on this request. Thank you. Good evening. This this request is to appropriate one hundred eight thousand seven hundred dollars to purchase the Gage property, which is an which is an eleven acre site on Sand Hill Road in Shutesbury. There is a matching grant from the Massachusetts Energy and Environmental Affairs Drinking Water Supply Protection 
uh, program, which is for $65,220. Um, the reason we're purchasing this property is that the property is in our zone A for our reservoir in, at Atkins Reservoir. So we try to protect the properties in the zone A by either having restrictions placed on the property or, or outright owning the property. The Gage family wanted to sell the property to the town so it would be permanently protected. Are there any questions from counselors at this point, noting that this will be on our agenda at another time this evening? Uh, Kathy Shane. It's not a question, or maybe it is just to get Guilford to confirm this is coming out of the reserves, um, not from, oh, where is the, the 108,000 coming from? The money would be appropriated out of the uh, water um, reserves, not out of the general fund. Thank you. Thank you. So the floor is open for public comment with regard to this item. And in general, let me just say, uh, if you are in the audience, please raise your hand. And if you are here in the town room, please make sure you have signed up with Athena for the purpose of this public comment. For those of you who just joined us, there are 29 attendees on Zoom, and I'm sure many others that are watching on Amherst TV. Um, and uh, we are doing the public forum with regard to the appropriation to purchase the gauge property. It's part of protecting our watershed. See no hands either in the town room or online. The public forum must remain open uh, till I'm going to say 6:40 to be safe.
It's 639. I'm going to call on the chair of the finance committee to give us just a brief statement of the finance committee's recommendation. Uh, the finance committee uh, discussed this on our meeting on June 4th, and we recommended to approve this purchase. <clears throat> Thank you. So, uh, Bob Hegner is chair of the finance committee. Please adjourn the finance committee, but please ask them to stay. Um, <laughs> point of order, I believe the finance committee is going to stay in their special meeting and then adjourn after the next public okay, forum. Yeah, we have to. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move to close the public forum and adjourn the public forum meeting and seek a second. Second. Uh, thank you. We're going to move to a vote. We'll start in this case with Donna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. And Pat DeAngelis, who just stepped out of the room. So that's an absent. Okay. Uh, we're going to be in a break of four minutes until we begin the next public forum. Meantime, I just want to make sure that if you are here, to comment on the public during the public forum on the regional high school track and field that you have signed up with Athena. So 
Oh, this next one at the end of it. Do you want to check in to make sure people want to leave their votes as they're, they're recommended? Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, type of a report or <laughs> official term term it should be. <laughs> Bob, I think your microphone is is on. There you go. Thanks. Thank you for your patience. Uh, it is still July, June 17th, and we are now going into our second public forum. This is a special town council meeting and finance committee meeting. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the special public forum on the high school track and fields to order at 645. I'm going to just quickly make sure you're still present. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Present. Anna Devon Gothier? Present. Councillor Ette? Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke? Present. Bob Hegner? Present. Councillor Lord? Present. Pam Rooney? Here. Councillor Ryan? Still here. Kathy Shane? Here. Andy Steinberg? Present. Jennifer Taub? Here. Councillor Walker. Here. Thank you. Um, and the Finance Committee is still in, in its meeting. So uh, there will be a special public comment period during this time. It will relate only to the high school track and field. Uh, we would like to begin with a very brief presentation. And Paul, I believe you're going to call on somebody, but I'll let you go. Yeah, so I, th I think, is it Dave or Doug? I forget who's going to. Dave, Dave Zomac, mm -hmm. Assistant Town Manager, will make the brief presentation. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, happy to be here tonight. And I am joined by the uh, Superintendent of, of Schools, Doug Slaughter. Um, I think uh, I'll be very brief. I think the community and the council uh, are well aware of the, the project before you in this public forum and later in the meeting. Um, we have put together a multi-year effort to plan and um, coordinate efforts to uh, replace the existing track and create a new field within that track at the regional high school off Mattoon Street. Uh, the town and the schools have been working very closely on this project and we've made great progress, great strides over the last few years. We've uh, brought on a consultant, SLR, uh, experts in the field of uh, experts in their in their craft of, of building fields for high schools and colleges uh, in the region. And we've refined our options. We started out with a dozen or more options and we're down to three. Uh, those options include two uh, east-west oriented uh, track and field proposals and one north-south track and field proposal. I think um, um, in general, uh, replacing the track and field has received strong support uh, from student athletes, coaches, parents, and the entire uh, regional school system in general believes that this project is a very high priority. Uh, there also appears to be very strong support uh, based on the feedback we've gotten in the various meetings we've attended and public comment for the North-South option. Uh, with refinements now in place, we have a much greater confidence in the design than we did months ago. We have studied groundwater, uh, wetlands, topography, uh, and a number of other factors with our consultants, and we believe we have a very solid plan and a path forward. Recent meetings with the Regional School Committee and the Community Preservation Act Committee and the Finance Committee have included extensive discussions on the three options and the funding scenarios uh, that can make uh, any of those options possible. And those are what bring us to the to this meeting today and to later discussion in your regular meeting. Um, I'm sure the council will have questions for the superintendent, for SLR, our consultant, and myself later in the regular meeting. 
but for now, I'll conclude my comments there. Thank you. Thank you, David. If you're in the town room and you wish to speak to the issue of the high school track and field, make sure you have signed up with the clerk of the town council. If you are in the audience and you wish uh, on Zoom and you wish to speak to the issue of the high school track and field, please raise your hand at this time. Athena, how many people have signed up that are in the town room? Three? Three. Thank you. And there, right now there is one person in the on Zoom. Is there anybody else on Zoom who wishes to speak to the issue of the high school track and field? There is a second person. I'm going to go with those two people. Uh, we're going to start with the town room, but before we start, let me say the following. Um, Anyone wishing to speak has already raised their hand. Uh, public comments are a matter within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views. I'm going to make it up to three minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment, although we will try to make sure that your questions are answered. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. I also want to just remind people that we must definitely follow the First Amendment, which restricts our ability to cut off speech. We'll recognize speech speakers in the order in which they have signed up, rotating between Zoom and in person. So we'll start actually within the room. The first person. Okay, uh, Mary Clays. Thank you. Thank you all for hearing me and all the work you're doing on this. I'm very familiar with this project. So my name is Mary Clays. I'm going to speak in two capacities, one in my role as the president of the Amherst Hurricane Athletic Boosters and one in my role as a town resident um, with five registered voters in our household, um, several of them who have graduated from the school, well, four of them who have graduated from ARHS and one this year, in fact. Um, none of whom, however, um, have actually played the sports for which I'm actually advocating for, because we all strongly believe in community and making things right for everyone. And that's why in my capacity as the president of the boosters, I'm advocating for doing this field project the, as, as best you can the right way. And I think with the reorientation, that's what we're promoting. Um, I know that the price tag is a little bit higher, um, $756,000 more. Sounds like a lot. In the scheme of things, it is not. In the scheme of our fiscal um, issues, I understand where people are trying to be fiscally responsible, but there's a lot of costs and um, reasons why you should consider doing the reorientation. Um, one, of it, one of the reasons why is um, this project has been in the making, in the works, and overdue. Um, people have been working hard on this project since 2017, 18, I think, is about when looking at this has been um, started. So I do believe that really focusing on doing it right, and by right, it would be reorientation, because that's going to benefit the most people. That is going to do several things, including um, putting when it's shifted, it puts um, people closer to the buildings. It's a forward thinking plan because there's other projects around that would be support the track and field being reorientated to the north-south um, orientation. Has improved access to locker rooms and bathrooms for the athletes, fans, and people using the, the space, um, including being closer to safe places if there's storms or microbursts or anything such, such as that. Um, ADA accessibility, um, and then just the biggest thing for the athletes are the the sun the sun facing in their eyes when they're trying to play the sport. So I'm 
I'm really asking you to help appropriate the funds and make this work. Um, the boosters um, worked really hard on the turf, artificial turf, but at this point in time, we want to refocus and say, please do it right. It's been over 30 years that this has needed to happen. If we don't do it now, the costs just get higher, and I don't think this will be a project that can happen um, after this is done. I mean, there'll be maintenance and resurfacing and such, but in any event, um, advocating. For thank you for your that. comments. Okay, thank you. I want to call attention to our new clock, which also makes that wonderful sound. Um, uh, we're going to now turn to the audience where Maria Kopecki, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. My name is Maria Kopicki, and I live in South Amherst. Uh, uh, there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle to secure the $1 million necessary for option three. Some actions we can do relatively easily, but many others are beyond our control, and there are always unexpected curveballs that we cannot even foresee right now. If anything goes awry so that we cannot bridge that $1 million gap by this fall, and the restrictions are still in place, we would either have to settle for option 1B or we would have to do this whole dance over again. Regional school committee meetings, town council meetings, finance committee meetings, community preservation act committee meetings, and then back to the town council. All of this takes time and energy and would probably result in yet another unnecessary delay in this project. The Regional School Committee is well aware of the desire by many on the council and in the region for option 3C. There is no need to take a vote to emphasize that point. Please remove all the restrictions now and let the Regional School Committee concentrate on their work to put the best possible plan forward. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're coming back to the room. Deb Leonard. Good evening. Um, my name is Deb Leonard. I'm a resident of Amherst. I also have two hats that I'm, I'm wearing this evening. Um, I'm speaking for myself as a, a regional school committee member, and I'm not speaking for the whole regional school, but I'm asking you all for as much latitude as you can give us to get this done quickly as we can without compromising the ability to apply for CPS, CPA funds in the future. Um, maintaining restrictions will either neither add nor detract from my commitment to find and advocate for funding sources other than requests from gifts from this town. As a member of the public and a parent, I would like to um, revisit a topic that I've brought up recently in, a, in another public meeting about the democratic process. So on November 7th, 4,597 people cast ballots in the town and elected all 13 of you amongst other people, not 4,600. Um, Five of you sit on the finance committee and I really appreciate and respect the work that all subcommittees do to get the work done in an efficient manner. But I do want to underscore that five is not 13. And the 13 of you are the ones who are responsible for the constituencies in this town. Um, I remain concerned about the oversized impact as I'm sure other people do as well. So I just want to underscore that there are vocal members of the public who are persistent. They still get their one vote. They cast their one vote or they had the opportunity to cast their one vote. But I'd like to point out that in the finance committee, five of you are responsible to the, um, the taxpayers and the voters. And there are other voices on that committee who are, don't have that, that kind of accountability. So I'd really like all of you to keep that in mind when you weigh both the recommendations and the input from the public. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Deb. Uh, we're going to the uh, Jennifer Shaw. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Jennifer Shaw. I live in South Amherst and I'm a member of the Regional School Committee and my comments today are my own. 
I want to ask you to remove the restrictions on the $800,000 of CPA funds and $900,000 of free cash that you authorized in 2022. The Regional School Committee is committed to getting this project done now, which is in the best interest of our students. These restrictions have not served us well on the Regional School Committee. They locked us into an option that met with much resistance and was ultimately not feasible financially. Delays have resulted and costs have increased in the meantime. It's time to work within our means while striving for the best possible project. When the Regional School Committee decided to open ourselves back up to all possibilities several months ago, we were able to get the project moving again. To meet our goal of a planned completion by fall of 2025, we need to make a final decision next week so that our designers can do their work. Please be assured that the Regional School Committee is very aware of the strong preference by many for option 3C, which includes reorienting the track and field in the north-south direction. We are also cognizant of the fact that even with the $800,000 in CBA funds and $900,000 in free cash, we're still $1 million short. We will need to deliberate and decide what is possible and desirable and balance that with the benefits of a north-south orientation. It's our responsibility as the Regional School Committee to understand what we would have to omit in order to afford a north-south orientation and to balance the risks and benefits of each approach. This will involve eliminating some items and seeing what we can include as alternates as we seek CPA funds from all four towns. If the restrictions on both sources of funding are not lifted tonight and we cannot find a way to bridge that $1 million gap, we'll have no choice but to fall back to option 1B, the least desirable option, which does not include reorientation and only renovates the field rather than complete, completely new construction with drainage and irrigation that option 1D provides. Option 1D, even with its east-west orientation, is a far better backup plan with completely new field construction and a cost that we know we can make work. My colleagues and I on the Regional School Committee will make every attempt to achieve the best possible facility. We ask you to respect and support our decision to remove restrictions so that we can do just that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Uh, we'll go back to the room. Liz Haygood, would you like to... Liz Haygood. Good evening, everybody. Liz Haygood, she, her, hers, pronoun district two, Amherst. First, I need to apologize to you. I got so bogged down, I didn't respond to your email. I appreciate your reaching out to me. Um, sure, you want me to use my teacher voice? Because I can do that. Um, I feel like we're beating a dead horse. Um, I have been to, I don't know how many meetings in the past so many years about this topic and how important it is for all of our students, um, our town, uh, members of our town and members of the four towns that use the track and all of the kids that I go and support each and every time they um, compete. If you could see the looks on their faces when they enter a different town's facilities and compare it to ours, their self-esteem self tends to wane just a little bit before they have to go out there and perform their best. We don't wanna do that to our students. We don't wanna do that to our athletes. We don't wanna do that to our town. Some of the most poorest towns and cities in Western Massachusetts have better facilities than we do. Chicopee has two. Holyoke has one. Springfield has one and they're building a new one, okay? So we need to put our money where our mouth is in support of our students, our student athletes and the town members that use that track. And we need to do it now. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And as I just got back from Oregon and I have to say that a number of our student athletes, Logan placed third in the discus, nope, shot put 10th in the discus, we had Ola Laura, Cora, um, Mariah, and Ella placed first in the girls' sprint medley. We had Ola Laura, Cora, Mariah, and Ruby place second in the four by one. So these kids are competing at a national level. Massachusetts sent the fifth highest amount of athletes to Oregon. And um, they were phenomenal. They had a great time. And this is what they can do and do better if we support them in this mission. I thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us, Liz. Uh, Sarah Marshall, please.
please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Sarah is in twice, so. I know, I'm trying to figure out which Sarah is going to enter the room. Can you hear me? Yes, and this maybe is you can. This is telephone, Sarah. <laughs> okay, Thank and you. Is, the, is the other I, Sarah? Sorry. Oh dear. Just, there's two Sarahs on our screen. I assume only yes, one I, Sarah. Yes, I had trouble raising my hand on one device, so I logged in on two other devices. Um, Thank Sarah you. Sarah Marshall, uh, District 4, Amherst, and Regional School Committees. Um, with your per well permission, I will uh, give a comment for the chair of the Regional School Committee, Sarah Bess Kenny. She was not able to log in. So this is what she has to say. The track and field project will be on our next meeting agenda. And I will note that's next Tuesday, the 25th of June. And I see absolutely no reason not to work with all the towns to have the best possible outcome for our students, which in my opinion includes a north-south orientation for the field and track. One of the hurdles will be requesting funds off cycle for the CPAs of other towns, but, oh dear. Um, but we can be ready to uh, make those requests as their cycles come around. And the uh, adding to go out to, or make requests for add alternates or phase construction is a good idea. Um, may I add, uh, my own comment is if I have time. Please, you do have time. You still have an Thank hour, you. a minute and 42 seconds. Okay. Well, I was at the finance committee meeting um, last week and I was, um, I, I, it was wonderful how much support there is for the North-South re reorientation. So if that is the way you, um, if you, by your votes later tonight, steer us to requesting more money from the CPA committees of the various towns, I will do everything I can to make that happen speedily. So thank you very much for your support. And I will take all my hands down. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Are there other people in the room? Talib Sadiq. Talib Sadiq. I'm actually a resident of Shutesbury, but I am the principal of Amherst High School. <clears throat> um, I'm hoping that you'll do whatever it takes to get the track project moving forward. Um, we try to educate the whole student and kinesthetically their physical well-being is part of that. Track amongst a lot of those sports probably do, uh, probably a more diverse number population of students who run track than there is in most other sports. It's diverse ethnically as well as socioeconomically. They make connections that last a lifetime. And when I was at Amherst High, one of the things that motivated me to do my homework was staying eligible for, you know, run track and play football. It's the same with students nowadays. Students who participate with sports get less discipline write-ups. They, <clears throat> um, they're in school more often. And again, it's another way for them to get bought in. Not every student loves math or science or social studies, but they'll do more if they have another tangible motivation. Uh, and the students that Liz named who did so well in nationals representing our town, I think it's time we invest and show them how much we really appreciate them. And talk is cheap. We have to put our money where our mouths are. And these kids who went to nationals, some of them may never have a track, a home track meet. So their parents, the ones who can't afford to travel, are never going to be able to see their kids run in Amherst because they don't have the means to go someplace else. We talk about equity and how we want everyone to have the same access. This is another example of how it's not happening. So I'm just really hopeful that, you know, do what you got to do to make this happen so that we can have home meets for our students and um, support them in meaningful ways. And I think this will do a lot for them and their self-esteem. Right. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Are there any other people in the room? Athena? No. Okay. That concludes the public comment period. I'm going to turn to uh, the chair of the finance committee and ask if he has any comments or uh, need to consult with your committee. 
Uh, yeah, we did uh, have a very long discussion of this issue. It lasted more than two hours, um, but it was very thorough. And I think the committee um, really um, looked at the the um, the various options from all sides and uh, came up with some strong recommendations. First of all, let me ask the members of the committee. Do you want, does anyone want to change their votes on any of the four motions? So the first motion was to recommend the council adopt the CPAC recommendation to remove the artificial turf requirement. Um, that was a unanimous vote. Um, second um, motion was to recommend the council approve the CPAC motion to rescind the restriction on the north-south orientation with a strong recommendation to pursue the north-south option and encourage the regional school committee to return to CPAC for additional funds to meet that north-south objective as soon as possible as needed. In this motion passed by a vote of four to one, um, the resident, um, the vote in opposition was in favor of keeping um, the north-south restriction so that money could be only used for the north-south project. Um, does anyone wanna change their vote on this issue? All right, motion three was to recommend, it, recommend the council remove the north-south orientation restriction on council order FYF 23005A, which appropriated $900,000 in free cash towards the project. This motion failed by a vote of uh, two yes and three no. Uh, one resident member did not support it. One resident member was absent. Um, basically, the, the committee the consequence of this vote is that the committee recommended that the project only focus on the north-south option. In other words, don't look at any of the other two options. Does anyone want to change their vote? Um, I, I would point out that the, the council has the option of accepting this recommendation or not. Um, the motion for, um, we recommended that the council not adopt uh, approval, appropriation and transfer order FY2403B, an order approving the town of Amherst gift, uh, the Amherst Pelham Regional School District $756,160 from free cash for the track and field project for the North-South Oriented Design Option 3C and the council strongly recommend the regional school committee to pursue a north-south option through CPA funding through the four towns. Um, the vote on this was unanimous uh, with one resident member absent. Does anyone wanna change their vote on this? Um, I guess two other things that I think we, we uh, I think Sarah uh, mentioned it briefly, but we strongly recommended that um, the project be phased so that whatever money we have at this point in time, we use to build what the final project will look like, whatever, whether it's reoriented or not. And the reason was we wanted to make sure that the, the school committee had time to raise the additional funds necessary to go, you know, to, to finish off the projects, uh, as well as uh, we felt very strongly that Amherst should not bear the burden of the extra cost by itself, but the school committee would have the option to go to the other three towns for CPAC or other for CPA or other uh, other funding. Um, so I think that covers it. Does anyone on the committee want to add anything? Kathy? Yes, um, the, the one thing I wanted to add, Bob, is that we also recognize for, for whatever reasons, one of the line items that was in the totals was not added to the total. So the total cost of the North-South is roughly $254,000 higher than what we saw in the diagram. So that also, so, th so that means the it still goes with get the more money from CPAC, but the the idea of phasing is there's some elements that would not need to be done right away uh, immediately and the track and the field could still be useful like redoing sidewalks there were several things that could be done later without 
undermining the project. So we identified some big ticket items and the designer, the designer agreed that that could happen um, so that it was feasible, not just, you know, it'll be half done because we phased it. It will be ready to be used, but there'll be some additions that would come later. Um, I should also point out that the reorientation, the three of project option 3C includes, um, first of all, creates a, a playing field, which is, will support all the school, all the sports that are done, uh, participated in, with, with um, in Amherst High School, as well as a second field, um, which will be a practice field or a field that can be used for other, uh, for other purposes that will be kind of where the existing field is now or the, the western part of it. So there's there's really two fields in option 3C rather than one field. And the field is is much it's large enough so that a soccer field which is I guess the the, the largest field will fit comfortably within inside the track. So uh, again all all sports uh, that are at uh, that students at Amherst High School participate in will uh, be supported by this. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments from the finance committee at this point? Okay. Then Bob, I'm going to ask that you adjourn the finance committee. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Any second? Second, Shane. All right, uh, we'll just go uh, in order on the screen. Uh, Councillor Haneke? Aye. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Andy? Yes. Uh, I'm a yes. Alicia? Yes. Uh, Bernie? Support. Matt? Support. Okay, so it's unanimous. Okay. Um, I'm going to move to close the public forum and adjourn the public forum meeting and seek a second. Second. Thank you. And we're going to vote on that very rapidly. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous. Uh, the forum is adjourned. And we will go back to the regular town council meeting. Okay. Lynn, for the record, you did need a vote to, to recess for that long. It's over 30 minutes. You need a vote to recess. We did need a vote and we did it. So now do we need a vote to reconvene or can I just say we're reconvened? You can reconvene. Okay. Seeing that we have a quorum at the council, we're reconvening the regular town council meeting. <laughs> at 7.17. Uh, we're going to go to the announcements and then soon after that, we'll go on to public comment. Please uh, place the announcements on the screen. And just let me call attention to the fact that we have two meetings, one on June 24th, that we will begin with a meeting with the Jones Library trustees, but we will also have a regular town council meeting. And that is the night that the budget for FY25 comes before the council, both the budget operating and capital, okay? Uh, and then the council will meet again on June 15th. And that is the night that we will interview candidates for the Jones Library trustees. July 15th. July 15th, July 15th. thank you. Uh, and meantime, there are a few other committee meetings, although I just want to recognize the fact that the Finance Committee has continued to meet uh, during the month of May. It met twice a week. And so I, they are continuing to meet, be trying to catch up with all the backlog at this point. So um, at this point, I'm going to ask uh, how, if you have in the room and you want to make public comment for general public comment, at this time, please make sure you have signed up with Athena. If you're in the audience and you want to make general public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Let me note that there are 39 people in attendance on Zoom. 
in the audience. Are there any other people on Zoom who would like to make public comment? I need people who are wanting to make public comment who are on Zoom to make to raise their hands now. There are seven people on Zoom who would like to make public comment. How many people are in the room? One. Thank you. We'll begin with uh, Tony Cunningham. Please enter the, oh, excuse me, before we start. Uh, again, public comments on matters of the, within the jurisdiction of the town council. Um, residents are welcome to express their views. We're going to do up to, oh boy. Uh, I'm gonna go with two minutes. Uh, the council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. As in the past, we have made very clear statement about respecting first amendment rights of people to speak and our inability to shut them off unless they are violating certain guidelines. Uh, we'll recognize speakers in the order that they have raised their hands. And I am going to, at this point, only be calling on eight people on Zoom and one person in the town room. Let's start with Tony Cunningham. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, thank you, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. I uh, just wanted to make a request that you move um, the postponed motion up in your agenda. It seems to be quite late in the evening with some substantial uh, action items prior to that. I looked up a couple of former times when uh, the right to postpone was enacted by councillors, and it seemed like at the following meeting, the item was the first thing handled. So precedents would indicate that you should be doing it first. So this is a request that you change the order. Uh, I would encourage all councillors to support Councillor Shane's motion um, so that the Town manager would not sign a contract with FAA to redesign removing historical preservation like the millwork, which cannot be replaced, and uh, also affecting the sustainability of the building. For example, not replacing the single pane windows with at, at a minimum double glazed. And then secondly, I just wanted to mention the memorandum of agreement. I saw there is a third amendment in your packet, but last time I checked, it wasn't on your agenda. And uh, I see a lot of issues with that MOA, and it looks like it hasn't been fully vetted. So I would encourage the council to direct the town manager to not sign that MOA. So do not authorize the town manager to sign that amendment number three. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. We'll go to the person in the room. Please come forward. Vince O'Connor. Vincent O'Connor, uh, 175 Summer Street, um, apartment 12. Um, earlier this year, um, before the frantic budget period began, I made three suggestions with regard to increasing revenue. Um, the first suggestion with regard to Amherst College, I think has been more than adequately taken up by both the council and the regional school committee. The second recommendation, um, discussing with the university the, their need to compensate the community for the impact of their commuter traffic on our roads. Uh, I heard recent comments from the manager on that issue. The third issue is something that is actually with, entirely within the control of the town. 
And that has to do with um, providing our state representative and our state senator with um, plus or minus 10, 20% estimates of the cost savings that could be accomplished by the Commonwealth moving to a single a universal. We have universal uh, health care, we, but we don't have single payer. Uh, we've gone to the expense of universal health care, but we have not achieved the budgetary um, savings that single payer will. And one of the most effective arguments and information we could provide our state representative, state senator, is the cost estimate of savings that would be accomplished both by the municipality and you have 10 this seconds. before the school committee. Um, and I would urge the council to ensure that this year, those estimates are formulated and provided Thank to our, our senator and representative. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Both of whom are sponsors of the universal single payer legislation. It's, it's Thank election. you for your comments. Jeff Lee, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Jeff Lee. I live in District 5. Um, and I really can't believe you would entertain the uh, amendment to the Library Town uh, Memorandum of Agreement uh, that's in your packet tonight, as well as endorsing the uh, draconian set of design cuts that are being proposed as uh, value management. Um, if you look at the June 1st capital campaign report, the capital, cam capital campaign is still $6.9 million short of its uh, commitment to the town to cover it, the library share. Um, and adding another $550,700 uh, to do the redesign required for the value management will bring that up to $7.5 million dollars short of their goal. And if you look uh, $7 million at the $7.2 million that they already claim to have raised is in the gift intentions and pledges column. So it's by no means certain. And when you consider the drastic uh, historical preservation and sustainability cuts that are being proposed, um, I seriously doubt that all of those donors are going to uh, continue to wanna donate. So I see this as poor fiscal management, poor value management, and poor stewardship of a historical library building. So please vote those down. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Maria Kopecki, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. Maria Kopecki, South Amherst. Uh, commenting on the library, I've sent you many letters and you've gotten, I'm sure, a lot of letters talking to you about why we need to stop this uh, misguided project now. Uh, the impact to the town is going to be devastating. The impact to the library, quite frankly, at this point, uh, would be devastating if the changes um, are enacted. So please do your duty to the town um, and direct the town manager not to sign any contracts to go forward, not to proceed with these uh, these cuts that nobody wanted from the very beginning. Um, the sustain I would just be really curious about what the sustainability committee of the Jones Library Project that hasn't met for a very very long time would even say about all of this. Um, Please vote yes on Councillor Shane's motion. Uh, do not enter into any further contracts for any of this. Um, you're not even, the, the library is not even in compliance with the existing memoranda of understanding. Um, so please do the right thing. Let's stop this. Let's go to something that we can afford and that we can accomplish and go do other things that we need to do in this town as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Ira Brick, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Ira Brick from District 4. 
I urge the town council to support the motion by Kathy Shane to stop the library project by telling the town manager to not sign a contract with FAA architects so that there will not be another 500 K plus spent on more value engineering to reduce the expansion by eliminating much of what was promised in the original plan, which was supported by only 3000 of our 40,000 residents. And that was back then. It has lost a considerable amount of that support. It is my impression that at least two thirds of the town council, as well as the town manager, understand the huge net negatives of the expansion plan, whether the original pipe dream or the current nightmare. You owe your allegiance to the well being of our town. We have multiple infrastructure needs more pressing than this flailing campaign. Be braver and vote against continuing this non-starter. Do not allow it to continue as a non-stopper. Tell the council and manager and your town that you support catching up on very delayed maintenance and figure out how to affordably bring the Jones up to speed and then to progress with hiring teachers, fixing roads and building the needed fire station and public works facility. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Ira. Shalini Balmilne, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Shalini Bell, um, District 5. Uh, so I just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge that the library trustees are elected by the residents of Amherst and they take the responsibility to steward the, fire, uh, the library's finances and programs incredib incredibly seriously. They've dedicated thousands of hours, countless hours in the past decade to meticulously plan this renovation guided by the expertise of professionals. The discussions I'm hearing in council about what they should be, what should be cut, what should not be cut, maybe we can arrange this, maybe we should rearrange that and let's pause and re rethink this thing. To me, that is outside the purview of the council. Yes, the financial implications are your responsibility. And so coming to the rebidding costs and the project costs, which is within your domain, the, re the rebidding process will not incur any additional cost to the town, from my understanding. And they are not asking for any additional funds. On the contrary, if you do take on the renovations, we know that... Uh, although it's disputed what will be the exact cost, but we kind of have a sense, the big big improvements that are needed, they are gonna cost a lot of money while still not giving us um, the programming, the, the benefits that a new library brings. The sustainability, there's a lot of talk about that. The new library, even with the proposed adjustments will be a far more energy efficient and sustainable building than our current facility. The building will be net zero ready and many of the conservation measure, measures listed on page three of uh, the architect's report on August 30 are still in place. It will contribute to the town's broad, broader sustainability goals. How much time do I have? I can't see the time limit. Oh, We're there it is. Okay. Okay. Eight seconds, seven seconds. Okay, okay, okay. So the last thing I also want to say is the outpouring support of the local and state legislators like Jim McGowan. Midi, Midi. Thank you for your comments, Shalini. Thank you. Um, Arlie, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, um, my name is Arlie. I live in South Amherst. And I would like to say to the proponents of the expansion, be careful what you wish for. Um, we hear a lot about the leaking roof the atrium roof, well, that didn't just fall out of the sky. That was the decision of architects and trustees to value engineer their plans. Um, and now we are in the same situation. If this goes forward, 12 weeks of rushed uh, cost cutting designs, you're really running the risk of winding up with some version of the leaking roof. So I would say again, be careful what you wish for. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I see additional people putting their hands up. 
I actually had only planned to call on two more people, uh, but I will think about that when we get there. Dorothy Pam, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You need to unmute. Hi, it's actually Bob Pam. I'm using her machine. Um, hey, Bob. That's okay. Mm. So, a short statement. It's time to accept that the expansion and rehabilitation of the Jones Library is not affordable. The design changes will probably make the project ineligible for historic tax credits, so the fundraising would be reduced equally for no net improvement in the project's affordability. Uh, the library, uh, which simply replaced the rough estimates of repairs proposed in 2016 and the, added the, the handicapped accessibility in 2020, simply used the industry inflation factors, realistic work on the repair alternatives required acknowledging that the starting of the project had a substantial risk of failing and it was not done. In the last year, we've seen the permanent loss of one of the library's boilers and the temporary failure of the fire safety system due to leakage and storm damage. Uh, repairs are overdue. We all recognize that repairs only will not be cheap, but this can move faster than many think possible. As I think about the work done on the expansion project, uh, we've had it has had some redeeming, redeeming features. The HVAC system needs to be replaced. It should be with a commercial scale air source heat pump system as was planned for the expansion project. It was to go on the new roof with visual baffles to keep it out of sight. I believe it can go on the 1993 building roof or if the atrium is, is rebuilt um, somewhere on the interior roof. The design for this system, including all piping and valves throughout the 1928 building have already been done by professional architects and engineers. I believe we now own those work products and using them should save us months and hundreds of thousands of dollars. The federal and state governments and the utilities offer grants toward energy work that meets their rules. You need to wrap up. Okay. Um, the heart of this is um, Amherst has other capital needs, but you know, we Bob, did not. Thank you for your comments. Okay, two minutes is not a lot. Carol Gray, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, Carol Gray, 815 Southeast Street, Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, so I heard the comment about uh, deferring to the library trustees. I appreciated that Bob Pam just weighed in as a library trustee who I believe is a treasurer and very familiar with the finances. I'd also point out that three prior uh, presidents of the trustees uh, have come out against this, came out against this project, adamantly against it, thought it was fiscally irresponsible, and that it would destroy part of our cherished library. I was a former library trustee, and I uh, I love the library, and I, I am completely against this project because it's going to destroy parts that we really love. Um, I urge you to vote against this project in every motion where you can. If you uh, find you can't vote against, I urge you to abstain uh, rather than vote in favor because this project is throwing good money after bad. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> the uh, the initial project was, uh, I believe, 33, 33 million. Now we're up to what, 47 million. And if we, if we had gone with that contractor's bid, it would be uh, almost 20 million more. Uh, this and it is costing us money every month. I think I might have read maybe two hundred thousand or something. It's it's costing hundreds of thousands every single month that we postpone killing this project. It should be finished. Um, I'm also very concerned about the historic preservation. The, when the Jones Library accepted CPA funds, we signed a historic preservation restriction. I'm concerned that all these eliminations of, of historic uh, woodwork and things like that may uh, put the town and the library in legal liability because it may be violating the historic preservation restriction. Um, I also am very concerned about the elimination of the green features. I founded the green committee of the Jones Library when I was a trustee. This is not the project the town wanted. We're about to cut perhaps 12 teachers. We need to stop this project now. Thank you for your comments. Nancy's iPad, please enter the room, state your name and where you live.
Hi, Nancy Gilbert, 166 Lincoln Avenue. I love the Jones. I walk by it. I go in it. I really want to see it preserved. However, and I wrote earlier to you that this project we keep talking about, I don't know how many times I've written to you and made comments, but please take the appropriate action to prevent the continuous financial drain in town caused by this prospective project. Please support Kathy Schoen's motion not to enter into a new contract with the architects for additional expenses for the new design work. It's a big drain. Please begin to focus on repairing and renovating our beautiful library. Please remember this is a library project, not an additional community center. Please view this project with the lens of the town's needs, the education of our children. We need faculty in the schools. We need a new fire station. We need a new DPW. Our roads are deplorable. Our sidewalks are deplorable. We need a new senior center or addition to the present senior center. We need money to go to the health department. These are just to name a few of the needs without ever increasing our property taxes, which are going sky high. And I know that many families are not coming to town because of our taxes and the schools, and that many elders are leaving because of taxes. Please vote to halt this project and the financial drain. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Sean Burke, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Sean, you need to unmute. We can come back to this person. Okay, Janet, Janet Keller, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Um, Janet Keller, I live on Pulpit Hill Road. And um, I'm asking you to vote yes on Councilor Shane's motion. This motion would release the town from a project that's unaffordable. And it the motion would allow the town to make cost saving, climate friendly repairs and replacements for the long term that would otherwise be valued and engineered out of expansion build, bidding documents. Historic features could be preserved in the mid to long term. Cost burden on taxpayers could be reduced through energy savings from installing a solar uh, HVAC system, triple pane windows, longer lasting roof, and retaining hi historic exterior brick and stone surfaces that don't need painting. Thank you for considering these comments. Thank you for joining us, Janet. Jan Janet. Sean, please enter the room and hopefully unmute and state your name and where you live. Sean, try to unmute, please. I've sent a prompt and they, this person doesn't seem to be responding, so I suggest we move to the next person. Okay, there are two other comments and that's going to be the end of them. Eric Zikos, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Eric Zikos. I live on Hulse Road in District 5. And I am speaking today so that I hope that you'll allow the MOU to be signed and give the designers an opportunity to find cost cuts and generate a more favorable bid for the Jones. I'm excited about the project and I think it deserves a chance. Thanks. Erica, thanks for joining us. Jennifer Shaw, and please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, Jennifer Shaw. I live in South Amherst and I'm a member of the regional school committee, but my comments are my own. I would like to plus one everything Shalini said, but replace Jones Library trustees with regional school committee and replace the Jones Library building project with the high school track and field project. 
I would encourage you each to think about how much you trust the Jones Library trustees with the building project and extend that same trust to the regional school committee about the high school track and field project. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. That concludes public. Oh, Sean, we're gonna try one more time. Please enter the room and unmute. Go ahead, you're unmuted. Oh, great. It's actually Rita Burke. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, good. Um, it's Sean's iPad, so I apologize. Um, but he's standing right here. And um, basically, I'd just like to say that aside from all that you've heard from me in writing about how we both feel regarding the Jones Library issue, um, I just wish to add that um, in response to now hearing again about how we should trust all the people that are elected into office to be doing the right thing all the time and never question them is very contrary to um, our life during the 60s and 70s where you question people quite often and still should be at times. Um, but if anyone thinks that because people are voted into office is a guarantee that they're always going to be doing the right thing well, I just think, and Sean's right here, he'll agree, say yeah, you agree, agree. okay, um, that there's no hope for any of us. Just look at our national situation. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Sean. That concludes public comment. We're going to go on with the consent agenda. The items were selected because they were considered to be routine and non-controversial. After I read the item, if you would like to remove an item, please state so. That does not require a second. To move the following items and the, and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, waiver of town council rules of procedure, uh, rule 8.6. 6A, adoption of the 2024 Juneteenth proclamation. 8B, acquisition of gauge property on Sand Hill Road for water supply protection and council order FY24-05E, an order appropriating funds for the Town of Amherst Water Fund Capital Program, um, purchase of watershed land for water supply protection. 8F, optional tax exemptions. 8H, amendment to the 2024 Charter Review Committee charge of the appointment date specifically, and 8I, amendment to summer town council meeting schedule. Please raise your hand if you would like to remove an item. Uh, Councilor Haneke. Item 8I, the amendment to the summer town council meeting schedule. Okay, thank you. Are there any other items? Seeing none, I'm going to move for a vote. Then Greesmer is an aye. I if you need a, a, a motion. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll second, second that motion. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Andy. Uh, okay. The motion's been made and seconded. Lynn Greesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. And Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. It's unanimous. Uh, did you vote, Lynn? I, okay, thank you. I did at the very beginning before I called for a second. <laughs> it was my recollection. All, all of the items that are under presentations and discussions are elsewhere on the agenda. We're going to move to action item 8A. And A1, 2, and 3 all begin, all regard the regional track. This comes in the form of eight, I mean, of four different motions. I'm going to place the motion on the table, seek a second, and then we'll move for discussion. The first motion, having been reviewed by the Finance Committee in a report, Kathy, I'm just requesting you show it on the screen, Lynn. Thank you. I, that's perfectly fine. Okay. 
having been reviewed by the Finance Committee in a report dated June 17, 2024, been published on the Town Bulletin Board for a minimum of 10 days on June 7th, 2024, and the Council having held a public forum on June 17th, 2020, 20, 2024, in accordance with Charter, five point, Charter Section 5.6, to adopt the CPAC, Community Preservation Act Committee recommendation to remove the artificial tourist requirement restrictions affiliated with the original 800,000 CPA award from June 2nd, 2022, the inference for the Amherst Regional High School track and field renovation project in council order FY23-08A. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Okay. Are there questions or comments on this motion? Pam. Just to clear a point of order, um, are we going to discuss and vote on each of these motions separately or do we discuss it in general? Um, we can certainly discuss it in general. And let me just point out, but it, I mean, we need to vote on them each separately, just to be clear, okay? So let me point out and review the four motions, okay? The first one is regarding the CPA money. It removes the restriction for artificial turf. The second one regards the CPA money. It removes the restriction for orientation of the field. The third one is the free cash money that the council voted before. That's $900,000. It would remove the reorientation of the field. And the last one is the request for new money, and that would be the additional seven hundred and sixty-one thousand fifty-six thousand, um, and that would have to come from free cash, unless it, following the recommendation that CPA has made, which is to come back to CPA for that money. Let me also mention that the reason that if, if we vote for the last one, you cannot use CPA money to replace all money already appropriated. So if you really want people to come back for CPA money, the schools to come back for CPA money, you want to vote no on the last one. I'm sorry? The last one's written in a negative. In a negative, you want to vote yes. I'm sorry. when we get Thank there. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, the floor is open for discussion. Uh, Councilor Ette. If someone else had a hand before me, did anyone? No. Uh, in that case, I think I would prefer if we went one at a time. Okay. So the um, motion has been made. Was there a second? Yes, there was Shane, a second. Shane, Shane, seconded. Shane seconded it. So this is the one that is the CPA money. It's the 800000 and it removes the artificial turf requirement. Okay? Ready to vote? All right. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegnum. Yes, aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Councilor Ette? Yes. Lynn Griesmers? Aye. It is unanimous. Okay. I'm going to place the next motion on the table and seek a second. Having been reviewed by the Finance Committee in a report dated June 17th, 2024, been published in the Town Bulletin bulletin board for a minimum of 10 days on June 7th, 2024, and the council having held a public forum on June 17th, 2024, in accordance with Charter Section 5.6 to approve the CPAC, Community Preservation Act Committee motion, to rescind the restriction on the north-south orientation in Council Order FY23-08A with a strong recommendation to pursue the north-south option 
and encouraged the regional school committee to return to CPAC for additional funds to meet that north-south objective as soon as possible as needed. Is there a second? Second. Seconds. Thank you. Con discussion, questions and comments. Mandy, uh, Councillor Haneke. I really wish this one was in two parts, um, but uh, it's not because it's how CPA voted their motion. But part two about strong recommendation to pursue North-South, I absolutely agree with. But I'm of the opinion that if we want, we're, we're the appropriating authority, we can put whatever restrictions on that appropriation we want. And if we want a North-South appropriation, a North-South a north -south track, we should put a north-south restriction on it. Um, I will get into more details when we get to the free cash funds on why I'm voting against removing north-south restrictions on that. Um, I don't wanna repeat myself 6 million times, <laughs> but um, this one I recognize there's some, some desire to um, follow the CPA recommendation because it is ultimately their recommendation of spending their own money, but I am still going to vote against it because I do believe that um, removing the restriction does not adequately um, say that we want this money used for a north-south track. And so I will be voting against this motion. Kathy? I will be voting for it as I did in the committee because I think it's important we allow flexibility. When you add the number up, the third option that is the North-South is a couple hundred thousand dollars more than we saw, so it's 4.4. That's a million more than the money we have available. So it's a gamble. We think we can get it from CPAC, but I don't think we should stop to say there is only one solution. I think if the school committee can do what they hope to do, and our CPAC, and meaning Amherst CPAC, said, come back to us, we're ready, come back. And our CPAC can move out of cycle because what in our discussion was they can do a bond authorization. They don't have spare money right now, but they can do a bond authorization. And the intention is to go to the others as well. If we can come up with that additional million dollars, it can be the second phase. We don't have evidence yet that we have a million dollars worth of phasing. Everyone should know. We came up with some big ticket items, lighting, sidewalk, a few others. So I think allowing flexibility, and I will say the same when we come to the council's 900,000 is critical at this point. We've got to deliver this. There's a timeline ticking here and the timeline on getting ready, they wanna get ready and go out to bid this year. So putting restriction on isn't necessary since the intent is to go this direction, but if they discover they can't, I wanna leave the, the flexibility for the middle option, which gives us a five lane, an eight lane track, a great field, but doesn't reorient it. And it does do drainage and a lot of other things. So again, I think, leaving flexibility as CPAC did do is the important thing to do here. I'm gonna pause for a moment and go to the chair of finance committee. Although Bob did review for us earlier how the votes went. Did you wanna tell us on this one, how they went? Okay, um, the, the motion passed by a vote of four to one, one res resident member supported and one resident as member was absent. Okay, and I'll come back to you for comment, uh, George Ryan. It would, I strongly support the reorientation for many, many reasons. Um, one of them has to do with the 2019 athletic facilities plan, which uh, one of the cornerstones of that plan um, is that the track be reoriented. And there are many other reasons why it should happen. Um, what would help me with this decision, I mean, there's this notion that we, we're not sure what we're gonna discover, quote unquote, in the next week. And so there's this, this sort of uh, sense of uncertainty, which I find deeply troubling. Um, which is why I'm leaning towards um, basically keeping the restriction because uh, I don't get a clear sense that there's a, a plan forward. And I'm hearing from some members of the school committee that um, they want this flexibility so they can go back to the other orientation. 
Um, it would help me if it were possible for either the superintendent of schools or for the assistant town manager, if they could, to speak to uh, what might be possible. Um, maybe what uh, Councilor Shane has said is that at this moment, uh, no one is sure. And so that's where we're at. But um, I would be helped if, if we had some sense that there is a, a sense of a plan, how this could happen in terms of phasing and in terms of doing this uh, in a way that, that would make it pretty certain that we'll get what is, I think, the best plan and one that's in agreement with the 2019 master plan. Both interim superintendent Doug Slaughter and uh, assistant town manager Dave Zomack are with us. Uh, would one of you like to speak? You could, why don't you take the motion down for the moment? Thank you. Um, Doug? Sure, I can comment. Um, you know, we would love to do the, the North-South orientation. I think that's the commitment of the committee. I think that was the, the conversation uh, as I understood it, not the, to say they took formal action relative to that. Um, I think we're still working through uh, a variety of ways we can, we can uh, you know, uh, approach the, the cost differential. Um, there are some things uh, relative to how we bid the project that might give us some flexibility. Obviously there's uh, CPA funds that we can seek. Um, in, uh, in the regional schools, we do have a, a, a capital stabilization fund that we can also tap into a little bit. It's not a huge resource and, and we don't wanna uh, sort of starve that resource for uh, you know, too much money because we do wanna use it for some other projects we have. Um, but nonetheless, you know, there are uh, a variety of ways we can approach this. We're still working through those, both with our designer and just thinking about the, the, the mechanics of, of the sort of bid process and the, and the possibilities there to, to uh, give us some flexibility relative to, to reaching out to other CPA committees and, and finding other funding sources. So I think it's a work in progress. Um, I think, you know, the conversations as I understood them with this within and around the, the topic with the school committee was that they would uh, prefer to go with the North-South orientation uh, if at all possible. And so we're still working on ways to, to approach that and, and uh, uh, you know, find a way to get the uh, level of funding we need to get that, that, orientation done. It's the best ultimate uh, project for us, if at all possible. Thank you. Uh, Dave Zomack, please. Uh, sure, Lynn, if I could just build on what Dr. Slaughter said, you know, I think, <clears throat> as we outlined in the, um, in the Finance Committee meeting, I think what we're looking at is a combination of three things, really, Know, a cost savings within the budget. And we appreciate um, some great comments from members of the finance committee, uh, members of the council and members of the, of the community. Uh, they have, you all have identified some potential cost savings within, within the current budget. I think I would call the second uh, uh, option would be phasing or bid alts, uh, bid ads. Uh, as, we, as we get closer to the final design, uh, looking at what can we uh, propose as alts within that bid or in addition to the base bid, uh, and those may need to be um, moved to a, a second a second year, if you will. And then budget adjustments as the design progresses. So um, under the first category, I know that um, the finance, one member of the Finance Committee pointed out uh, a small um, discrepancy in our budget for option, I think it was in all the options, but it was a saving of, of $50,000 uh, for uh, one of the um, the shot put or one of the uh, uh, track and field events. We're looking at a potential savings of $350,000, at least this would be in the phasing category um, for doing the conduits and then the bases for the lights and then moving the lights themselves either to a bid alt or to a future year. We're also looking you know, creatively at working um, with the town, of course, on the sidewalk along Mattoon Street. That is in the public way. Currently it's in the, uh, it's in the budget for about 80 to $100,000. We're also looking at whether we can move things like um, uh, goalposts, safety netting, things like that uh, to alts or to private fundraising or to future years. Um, you'll also note in the budget and, um, SLR is here. Kevin, our consultant from SLR is in the, in the room. Happy to have him jump on if there are specific questions, but we're, 
We're also carrying a very comfortable and conservative contingency right now of 551,000. That's 15% of the overall uh, project cost. As we move toward final design, that will likely move from 15% to 5%. So there's a significant savings there. We're also carrying about 175,000 uh, for uh, potential inflation on the project between now and, and construction. Um, SLR has uh, um, quite a bit of experience bidding these projects right now. And, and in general, uh, horizontal construction is is um, uh, much more predictable these days than uh, vertical construction. So we're looking at a combination of cost savings, phasing or bid alts, and then budget adjustments as the budget, uh, uh, is, as the uh, design is, is progresses. And then of course, as, as uh, the superintendent noted, going back to Amherst CPA, Leverett, Pelham and Shutesbury. And again, uh, happy to have um, our, our our consultant uh, from SLR answer any more specific questions you might have. Okay, let me go on and ask other counselors if they have questions or comments. And then I do wanna come back to Kevin who has been nice enough to join us this evening. Um, Bob Hegna. Yeah, I just, uh, I just wanna, I, I am in favor of rotating the track, but I do wanna point out that the option 1D provides a pretty good playing field. It's It's not, north south oriented but i but, but, uh, but uh, kevin cor correct me if i'm wrong but i believe you could get the soccer field on there it's just the only sport that won't be supported on that is the football is that correct uh, the way it's currently designed uh, under any scenario um it would accommodate all national federation high school sports including soccer and football um the track configuration we show option under option uh, 3c is a slightly different shaped running track um, and it allows for a slightly larger wider soccer field um, but again both would be within national federation um, uh, standards for competition play uh, just with option 3c you get a little more overrun area between the track and the field um, so there's some benefits of that reshaping of the track right so i guess the the council should understand that the, the option 1d gives us a really good playing field. It's just oriented in a different direction. Right, thank you. Lynn, if I, could I just add one comment to that, Lynn, before Please. you move? And and I think uh, Bob made this comment earlier, but I just wanna re reemphasize that uh, option 3C actually gets us two north-south oriented fields. It gets us the field within the track and the field to the west, which will be a much improved field to the west with the east-west orientation, either one, um, we do not get that new field and the fields to the north, if if there was an east-west uh, new track and field, the fields to the north would be basically the same as they are now, which are not really high quality fields. So um, we wouldn't get a perfect field to the west in the north-south orientation, but we get a much improved field than what is there uh, today. So thanks. Yeah, and, and that is in our report that you all have just a, a picture of what that looks like. Um, Anna. Pam. Oh, I'm sorry. And I think mine was the first. Anna is showing oh. up on my screen next, but I don't know why. Okay, go ahead, Pam. Pam, please After go you. ahead. Um, I like the fact that uh, this review of the design elements and some of the opportunities for cost cutting is being done now at the beginning of design. I think that's a really good strategy. Uh, that said, I still support removing the restrictions on the orientation. Um, I think we just need to be eyes wide open as we go forward because there may be some unexplainable costs that we aren't aware of. I also do have some questions about um, the 3C that perhaps Kevin or, or David can ad address. And when I look at, since we're talking about this now, um, when I look at 3C and I look at the orientation of the, of the playing field uh, and the proposed uh, additional or new field to the, to the south of it, um, I do not see the money for that new field in the cost estimate 
all I see in the cost estimate is $160,000 for lawn top topsoil seeding and lawn. When we looked at a well a well planned and well designed and built infield for 1D, uh, it includes drainage, it includes good uh, well draining material that allows that track to be used um, much more extensively than the current fields do. So that cost, when I looked at 1D, the cost of that infield construction is more like $700,000, not $160,000. So I think the price is gonna be higher. When I look at uh, option th three again, <clears throat> and I overlay the existing playing fields, um, we actually lose two playing fields. We will get a we will get a seeded lawn as a replacement, and and we also lose two additional fields. So I don't I'm I'm not convinced that the uh, that the new southern field um, is actually going to cover the loss. Um, I, enough for now. Um, Kevin, would you like to address those issues? Yeah, so I think Dave, that David mentioned it, that that second field isn't going to be as high performing as the field that you'll get within the track. Um, the budget just won't allow uh, an extensive uh, under drainage system and an amended uh, root zone uh, topsoil layer and a uh, new irrigation system. But we will have a surplus soil coming from the new track location that would be placed. It would be laser graded, shaped. Um, there, we'll put as what amendments we can afford into it, um, but it will be lacking some of the features. Um, and so that's why the budget is is much less uh, than the the engineered field, we'll say. Um, the fields, as I know them, to the north that exist above the east-west track currently. Um, from what I can see from striping on aerials and uh, what I've seen in the field. Um, they're not regulation size fields, but there are two areas. Um, I think one of those areas would be retained, but it still would not be a full competition field. Um, but what we are planning on creating a full size grass athletic field to the west of the uh, north south orientation. It doesn't it doesn't appear that there's enough room for a full size to the west of this of the new playing field. And I hate to think of the material that's coming out of the area that the that the the new track layout would cover. It is really mucky sediments. And I would hate to think that that's what's going to get placed on a new playing field. Kevin, did you have anything else you wanted to address with that? Yeah, uh, no, it's just, you know, we'll do as much as we can with the budget we're given on that field, if that's the option we go with. Anna. Um, thank you. A couple of thoughts. So the first thing is the, the, I didn't organize them well. Okay. So we know that our fields are overused by at least 150% right now from the report. Taking out a grassy area that is not a regulation size field and adding in a field, even if it's not as fancy as the one inside the track, is adding resources for our student athletes that they desperately need. Um, the professional engineers that do fields for a living are telling us that they have space to put a full regulation size field if we reorient the track. I trust them to know that. Similarly, I trust them that if they say the soil can be used to make a field as it currently is underneath the field, uh, that that would happen. I think that the questions that I'm having are a little bit of the zooming out here, if we can. And I'd like someone to just restate um, the, the, the implications of saying that we cannot or that we will not remove the restriction. Uh, I would like to know, does that mean that if they discover they can't, if the school regional school committee discovers that they cannot go with option three, that it's not viable, that they would come back again, or sorry, 
if we say, no, you can't remove the the restriction, they say, we can't do this with the money we've got. Do they then come back to us again to ask again, to remove that restriction with a concrete plan in hand? Are we, I'm trying to figure out what we're, what the implications are of both of the, those votes. Um, are we, what we're doing is what we're doing right now, saving them coming back to us if they determine they cannot do option three. And then what I'm trying to figure out is what else is going to change within this next week that isn't just damning this project to be option one D or one, whatever, one of the ones, because if what we're saying is that we need them to also seek other funding from other towns, and we know that the other towns aren't going to pull their CPAs together and make a decision on this in the next week, which is when the regional school committee is saying they need to know the answer by, how is that, what, why would we, how is that going to go anywhere with, with option three? So if I'm missing something about the timing here, someone please correct me, but I'm, they're saying they need to send in a, a decision by next week, but also that we should give them the latitude to go to other CPAs and seek alternate, alternate funding sources within the next week. Am I missing something? I think this is where the benefit of the finance committee discussion would be helpful. And so I'm going to, um, while I listen to it, I'm not going to try to recount it. Uh, so I'm going to actually look to the finance committee to, if you can, explain the issue of phasing in, or perhaps Doug or uh, Dave Zomack would do that. Sorry, Lynn, that, that is part of it, but that's not the entirety of my question. I just want to make sure the other part is captured as well, which is what is intended to be done differently in the next week that would emphasize our strong preference for a north-south orientation. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, do you want to start or should I go on to uh, Dave Zomack and Doug? Um, I can start. Um, I think that the, the issue of phasing uh, was really one way to keep the budget within the money that we had at the, at the time we have right now without having to add any additional money. I'm not sure we're there yet. I'm not sure we can save enough to, to do that, but that was the basic idea. The idea was not to take anything off of the, not to change anything in the project, but to delay certain aspects of the project so that um, we could move forward with what we have now and then add on the other pieces as money became available. That's the basic idea behind the phasing. It's not to cut anything out um, it's really just to delay certain elements of the project. And, and David may, may mentioned some of them. It's, um, you know, it's the lighting, um, the uh, sidewalk along Natoon Street. There, there are certain big ticket items that we could, we could save a lot by phasing that, by moving that to a separate phase, bidding it out separately. It it's not clear that we have enough money to do that. Kathy and I'm so let me just yeah. give you an example. The original ticket for the lighting is like seven hundred thousand. While you're doing the field, you would at least do all the conduits and you would do the bases for the lights, but you actually wouldn't install the lights. That would be phased in later and perhaps paid for by CPA money. There's just an example of the phasing concept. Does that help, Anna? I understood the phasing concept. That wasn't what my question was. Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna call on Mandy Jo. I was gonna make some other comments, but I will try to try and summarize what the council is being asked to sort of do in a somewhat neutral manner. Let's try. So. The council back in 2022 on CPA's recommendation voted a financial order that had two restrictions on it. We already voted to remove one of them. So it now from 2022, uh, a 900, 900, 800,000 financial order has a restriction of North South. Um, back in 2022, the council and all three other towns voted to approve 
a one and a half million dollars borrowing from the region. Back in 2022 in December, the council also voted a free cash appropriation gift to the regional school committee of 900,000 with a north-south orientation restriction. All that money together. And then a couple months ago in February, the school committee came to us and said, and all four towns and asked us basically to revote the one and a half million to remove the north-south restriction and the turf restriction that was on that. Um, they said at that time it was very immediate. We needed to do it now. Um, couldn't wait. And now, just a month and a half ago, they did the same thing with this, and I'll get into that. They got those estimates a month and a half ago or so that said option 1B can be done almost within just the borrowing authorization, that one and a half million. Option 1D cannot be done within the borrowing authorization, but if restrictions are removed, has enough money to do it. Although finance committee has realized it does not with restrictions removed have enough money because it did not include the design fees of 250,000. But option 1D only has a million point seven available right now, but it needs three point something million. Option 3C needs 4.2 to 4.4, depending on how you can count those design <laughs> restrictions. Um, and available right now for option 3C is $3.7 million. Um, and so they, the school committee said, well, we need more money for 3C. And so we're gonna ask the town of Amherst for more money for 3C, but we also want those restrictions on 3C's money, that $1.7 million that 3C can do, removed so that money can also be used for 1D. They have told us they need to know our answer by next week so they can make a decision on which design to go with to continue designing a, a plan because they need to now design which direction that track is going. They don't need to fund that design plan until December. So this is where the finance committee had a two hour discussion because they need to pick their design next week. And the school committee has basically told us in various different phases that they want whatever design they pick fully funded by next week or confident that it will be funded when they pick their design next week. The finance committee realizes that if we're not on this financial order, the extra 750 they've asked for, if we fund that through free cash and they go with 3C, we cannot use CPA money to fund that in the future because we cannot supplant any already funded money with CPA money. Right. And so if the council wants the school committee to ask for CPA money for the additional, by the way, that financial order has a North South restriction on it. Um, if we, if we want CPA to use CPA for a North South, we cannot fund the financial order because we wouldn't then be able to get CPA money for it because it would supplant and would be against the law. So we cannot, if we want 3C, but also want to use CPA, fund the new financial order. But if you don't fund the financial order, the school committee is left with 3.4, 3.7, 3.4 million dollars. Three, four, seven, three, eight, four, four, eight. for option 3C, or if we remove the restriction 3.4 for option 1D, and well then 1D is nearly funded, but 3C is not, and they pick the design next week. And so the decision we have to make is when they're picking a design and telling us they want 3C, but they also want full funding of, of a design when they pick it next week, if we remove the restrictions, can we trust them to go with 3C even though they don't have all the money for it? Um, so that's sort of how I look at the decision we have to make. Um, as simplistically as I can try and explain it, I'll keep my hand raised, but you can go to others to say why I'm going the way I'm going. Anna, did that get to your questions? Yes. At first, I thought I was going to have to explain to Mandy that I also did understand all that first part too. But no, uh, the December key element is, is what's the, uh, yeah, that was what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia. Councillor Walker, excuse me, mm -hmm. Councillor Walker. Um, it's okay, thank you, Lynn. So I, 
I mean, Mandy Joe summarized a bit of the timeline that I was going to summarize, but I think the question that she ended, she ended with in terms of do we trust them is not the same question that I'm asking myself. Of course, we trust them. They're elected officials. Um, and we talk about how we should trust other committees to do what they need to do. And those decisions, while we do have a preference, and I know it's in good faith, and I also am strongly in favor of option 3C, three, three it's the purview of the school committee to make that decision, to make the decision as to which option they move forward with and which option is feasible with what they have. Um, and so I think we've heard from school com committee members, we've heard from the superintendent and the assistant town manager in terms of the desire and intention to pursue seriously option 3C. And I'm not sure at this time, considering their timeline and their plan of events, that we can ask them to do more than to seriously consider and try to pursue that option. Um, and then also thinking about what unintended consequences the vote might have if we do not remove the restrictions and the school committee does not have enough money to move to option 3C despite trying to pursue it seriously. Um, they have a timeline they're trying to meet, which I think is part of what makes this a little bit more complicated, um, where we would then be locking them into doing probably the least favorable of all the options. So right now, basically, our vote is signaling to them it's all like the best or the worst. We're not getting anything in between. Um, and I think that that's problematic considering most of the decisions that we're talking about and considering are under the purview of the school committee. So we don't actually have the ability to make those decisions. Um, and so I think similar to what CPA did in terms of writing a very strong message, displaying what our thoughts are as a committee, if that ends up being everybody's thought. I know I don't speak for all of the counselors here, but I, I feel like I'm getting the sense that a lot of people are also very much in favor of pursuing option 3C. And so maybe sending a very strong worded letter to them with whatever we vote would suffice. Um, but I, I am troubled by locking them, potentially locking them in to having to decide an option that they do not want to pursue just because they don't have enough funding or they don't have enough time. Jennifer. Uh, thank you. So I agree with what Councilor Walker just said. I'm in favor of lifting the restriction. I do. Um, I have a couple of questions. If we don't lift the restriction and they and the school committee can't raise the funds for 3C, they do have the money for 1B. So that so that's my concern. If we don't lift it, that we may get 1B. Um, my next question is, I sat in on the CPA meeting last week and uh, they said they were so supportive of re or of the 3C that they would even meet out of session to make a decision sooner. So my question is, if we lift the restriction and next week the school committee has to determine what plan they're going to ask to be designed, could they, if they don't yet have the money in hand for 3C, but they feel pretty confident that the CPAC, that the committees in the or towns will approve it. And Amherst, which would have the most funds to give, has pretty much said they will meet early. They will do everything they can to provide the CPAC funds for 3C to happen. So next week, if we lift the restrictions and don't require only 3C, we don't hold out for just 3C, could the school committee ask the designers to begin designing the reorientation on the, not the hope, but um, on the verbal commitment that they've received from the Amherst um, CPAC. I think the person to ask that question of is Doug. Yeah, so I think the, <clears throat> be careful in my response, I think. Um, so I think that, you know, everybody would like to move in the direction of 3C. And I think it's sort of what's the level of, of confidence uh, that we can get there. And so I think that's part of what we're evolving. I think the other thing I'll share is just, you know, I, you know, school committee is not met. So some of these, you know, uh, ideas of 
a phased approach or or uh, returning to CPAs in each of the four towns um, have not been, you know, I'm happy to fill out those applications. That would be what I would do. Um, that's not something the school committee is necessarily going to do, but but um, I think they're, uh, you know, obviously would be interested in those sources of funds and those, those uh, you know, that kind of outreach. Um, you know, I think if, if we can get, we're going to have to make a judgment as far as what we tell our designer to do. Uh, if we feel like we can get pretty close with either a phased approach um, or, uh, you know, other you know, sort of alternate ads that we can put into our, our bidding when we do later, you know, when we do that later, if we feel like we can get pretty close with the resources available to us, then, then, uh, you know, we'll move forward with that 3C design. Um, I think we have to get, you know, pretty close, I guess, is a short answer. Uh, you know, we've identified a few, um, few things that we could do as far as phasing it. Um, and we, what here's, I guess the risk for, for the school committee is the following. If they tell the designer to go with 3C and we get to, you know, when we're ready to bid and those other pieces of it don't materialize, the other funding don't materialize, we're going to have to go back to our designer and ask them to rework uh, the design to something other than what they've done. We're going to have to go through our, our permitting process with the town again. So that's what we really want to avoid is that sort of double spending for design and double spending for uh, uh, and double effort around things like permitting. Um, so obviously, most flexibility makes it easiest. And I think that, you know, we'll we'll try to make the best uh, judgment we can to, to move ahead with 3C as, as, as the direction we'd like to go if we can get it pretty close, which I think we're right there. Um, that would be the direction the school committee is going to want to go to. Um, I think the the risk, though, is just is you know, do we end up in a circumstance where uh, we have to rework design and rework permitting process uh, that delays us in some way? That's the that's the only real concern we have. But again, you know, if if we can get pretty close on a you know, thinking about how the funding might fit together from alternate sources or a staged approach or whatever, then I think uh, you know we'll will likely move ahead with that reoriented track. Pat, you've had your hand up and down. Did you? Uh, well, yeah, I, and I other people places. have spoken. No, I, I'm going to try not to repeat what anyone said, but it would be helpful if people could, um, if Athena can yeah, speaking. pull up the spreadsheet for 3C. Oh. Said Kathy, I misheard. I, I'm sorry. Pat, um, I'm, I'm uh, listening to all this and, and issues of trust and not trust, and, and it's not that for me. Uh, it is that 3C creates, uh, 3C creates a situation in all of the fields that integrates them. So the softball field uh, is, is, will be different. Uh, the, there's this extra playing field. There's more. There is the possibility, if it's reoriented, of using the hill even to seat people before bleachers happen. Uh, it, um, it improves the number of athletic events that can happen there. Uh, it makes it a short walk for the home team. It makes it convenient parking, and. Uh, it will really connect to the, if there are renovations at the War Memorial and everything. So for me, uh, mostly though, it will empower our athletes who are amazing. I mean, they're winning using terrible facilities on, to practice, but what can they accomplish? How can they be empowered or enriched by the transformation of these playing fields? And I feel strongly that removing the restriction, and this is why my hand has been going up and down, I've been listening to other people. Um, I, I feel like lifting that restriction um, leaves us without the kind of playing fields that I think we really need to have. Thank you. David, you had your hand up and then I'm also in the process. Athena, could you start finding the slides where we have the table that shows the options? Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, Lynn, before you share those, um, Kevin is here tonight 
he has, you know, slightly reworked the, you know, particularly 3C. Uh, he has two slides. One is on uh, potential project bid alternatives and similar um, options. And then he has a new slightly amended adjusted budget for 3C. So before we show something that's a little bit dated, um, could we possibly go to Kevin and have him share those two slides and walk us through those if that's where Kathy was going? And, and Lynn, I just want to say that is what I wanted. Thank you. Kevin. Uh, yep. Uh, I'll go ahead and share. We're going to ask to have to ask uh, Athena to allow you to share. Okay. Yep. No, I have permission. Um, okay. Thank you. So, as David mentioned, we just went back to pull the uh, design fee below the line on the spreadsheet. Can everyone see it on my screen, by the way? Yes? I'm not hearing a yes. Oh, someone's asked if you could just enlarge it a little bit. Oh. Thank you. Bear with me. All right. good. Is that good? That's, so that's good. The two major things, um, it was pointed out that in the running track and events breakdown, we did have uh, both pole vault event area and shot put twice. So we removed out the redundancy there, which removed, let's say roughly 55,000, I think was the number from the total. We also pulled our design fee below the project total costs. Well, it was always described here, obviously it, this being above the line, made it appear that it should have been incorporated in that number. So that's all the changes that we've made to our, our current um, cost estimate for all three options. Um, but this brought the project number down to uh, 4,160,000. And again, a, a big point that we keep making, and I'll go to the alternate slide in a moment. Um, as David mentioned, at this level of design, uh, where we're somewhere between schematic and Preliminary design, we're still carrying a hefty contingency of 15%. And uh, by the time we're at final design, that will be at 5%, um, which will uh, represent a significant savings. And also a 5% inflation, um, that's really uh, just a cautionary uh, 5%. Uh, past projects, we annually would uh, carry 3%, but because of pricing escalation that we've seen over the past couple of years, um, which was actually up over 7%. Um, at this point, we're uh, we're carrying five, but we may feel comfortable enough. And again, as Dave mentioned, we have bid some similar projects just this past year. So we uh, use that current pricing when do, uh, developing these estimates. Um, so there could be some savings with the uh, inflation that we wouldn't see when we go out to bid. Uh, the second slide we prepared is just some of the potential project bid alternates. Uh, the big ticket item being the electric, uh, the athletic field lighting. And uh, as mentioned, this would, under the base bid, we would just install uh, empty electrical conduit, uh, pole boxes, and then the actual concrete foundations for lighting. We've done this on numerous projects where even multiple years later, uh, funding's uh, put in place and it's a, a quick one or two day installation and the, the lights are, uh, craned on top of those foundations, the, uh, the wires pulled and the, the controls are installed. Um, so we're saying that's about a $350,000 savings right now. Uh, Mattoon Street, uh, the curbing and sidewalk improvements that are shown on all three of our plans, uh, that's a plus or minus $90,000 savings if that can be funded elsewhere. Uh, ball safety netting, which doesn't really, isn't depicted well on the, uh, the renderings, but behind each, uh, Goal area, we uh, typically on new facilities, we install 15 to 20 foot high netting that runs across the back of the goals. Um, this allows for uh, you know use of certain areas of the track while games are being played or practice, uh, creating safer areas. Um, you know, a lot of people like to stretch in the high jump areas and warm up. Um, so ball safety netting is something that we typically put in design, but it's not a cheap element. But what we... Uh, have done in a phased approach is just put the foundations for the net poles. Um, those go in a concrete curb along the back of the field, um, and they're relatively a uh, small expense when compared to the poles and the nettings themselves. So that's 
uh, plus or minus a $70,000 savings. Uh, some of the other items we just discussed were walkway scope reductions. Um, this we're gonna have to look at a little closer to see exactly how much reduction we could do, yet still maintain um, ADA accessible walks to all necessary areas. Um, and then chain link fencing. Um, our plans call for for two uh, for option 1D and 3C um, call for a four foot high chain link fence around the, the track itself. Um, and you currently don't have that. So if we remove that and just replace the chain link along Mattoon Street, um, still uh, controlling access to the site, um, that could be almost $100,000 savings there. So a combination of those and then with a reduction of contingency, which at the current budget it would be almost $360,000. Um, it's, it's a good amount of uh, project alternates that we can put in there. Well, could I have this up. Is there anything else uh, anyone would like to see? Could you go back to the first slide? Yes. So what you're saying on the first slide is that the total project is four million one sixty, or do I add the two fifty four? Uh, but when this was brought to our attention last time, um, I didn't have an answer for that question. I, I, we had not included it in the construction cost, um, and then partly that was just my fault not asking the question, uh, assuming that you know our design services were funded and not coming out of the uh, the construction budget. Um, now we understand that you know there was confusion in this and then potentially an oversight on our behalf. So currently the one you would add our design fee to the 4,160,000. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 414, thank you. Um, Let's see, uh, Anna, you have your hand up. So of the bid alternatives, without reading the full CPA law, um, Dave, do you have an estimate on what of those are eligible for possible CPA allocations in the future or requests, excuse me, in the future? That's part one. Yes. As far as I know, anything that is a permanent structure at the facility would be CPA eligible. The only thing that is not CPA eligible um, is artificial turf, and we removed that from the project. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So that, That's what I know, thought I wanted to. Some time ago, months ago, when many months ago, when all these votes were taken, they were taken relative to an artificial turf field. And we knew full well at that time that CPA funds could not be used for that part of the project. But anything that is attached and 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 quote permanent uh, fixture at the at the at the facility, I believe, is our CPA eligible. Okay, so if I mathed this, which I I had not known for that in my head, but I did this in my head, it's around six sixty, ignoring the TBD items and ignoring uh, is that seem trueish those those um those costs so that's 660 that could get spread out or um requested through CPA funding for for 3C um i think i i want to clarify i don't see for myself i'll speak for myself always um i don't see this as an issue of trust i i see it as an issue of logistics and i apologize if i insinuated otherwise uh, Doug, you said we'd need to be confident in funding and get pretty close, but again, pretty close by when, because we're hearing next week and I just logistically do not see how we can reasonably get close to 3C by next week, December, maybe. But if that decision is being made by next week and, and, dis and confidently pursued by next week, because we don't want to go through permitting twice and need to be confidently pursuing one direction. Again, I don't see how we're just making a false choice by by removing that um, removing that restriction, and we may as well just vote one D or whatever or one what B. So I, I genuinely, uh, if we first question is if we don't lift it and they don't have the money by December, they come back, correct? 
or are we just saying no project? Because what I'm hearing is they would come back and say, we have to pay the design fees again, recognize that, and it would slow the project, but they come back to, to explain why they now have pursued it and and that CPA funding didn't come through or the other funding didn't come through. I, I would like to hear someone who's truly believing that we should remove the restriction while knowing and acknowledging that the school committee needs to pick one and would like to do that by next week, including would like to have that funding secured or knowing where it's coming from, hypothetically secured by next week, how we aren't kidding ourselves with this I, I, I do genuinely want to hear because for me, it feels like a vote to remove this restriction. I don't see how this wouldn't go to project one of the one options if the school committee is, is saying, which we heard them say, that they need to have this decision made by next week, including the funding. Okay. Mandy Joe. So Anna's, in some sense, slightly summarized why I don't support removing the restrictions because the school committee in my mind, actions speak louder than words. And the school committee's actions have been in February to ask us to vote to remove a north-south restriction on the borrowing money while saying that they want a north-south project and not doing anything other than asking us to remove the restrictions to a north-south project. They did not apply to any CPA committee in February, despite our pleading to apply to CPAs out of cycle for funding for a North-South project. Then about four or five weeks ago, whenever this one came in and they made their votes, they kept saying they want a North-South project, yet asked us to remove the North-South restrictions on all the funding. And even asked the CPA to remove their restrictions while not also simultaneously instructing their superintendent or themselves actually asking and applying to the CPA for additional money for a North-South project and said they came to us for free cash, which under all of our financial guidelines is not what our, finan our financial guidelines say no under two reasons. One, it's not a use for free cash. And another one says, we want if CPA money is eligible, we fund those things through CPA, not free cash. And they instead asked us for free cash and they still haven't applied to any of the four towns for CPA. And so their actions in my mind say, while they're saying they want the North-South, all of their actions point to, if we remove these restrictions, 1D is the project we will get because their actions have not shown up till now that they will pursue a North-South in the manner they need to, given the trust level, not, given the the, tr the lack of risk they've said that they want when they pick a design next week. Kathy. And so from where I stand, if we want North-South, we need to keep the restrictions on. Kathy. Um, it, I, I thought it was very helpful to have the numbers up on the board because the issue, Mandy, we've been not voting for the same thing on this for a long time. It, the problem has been we haven't had enough money for the North-South. And it wasn't the school committee that came up with Ask Us for Cash. It was a suggestion of staff. Um, they were actually, a few of them were pretty reluctant because they were also asking for more money for the operating budget at the same time. So I think Anna's uh, math, quick math was accurate. You know, we've got about 610, maybe 660,000 that could be phased in 3C. We need a million, unless there's magic, that 250,000 design fee has to be paid by someone. So it is part of the cost. So I, by removing the restriction, I understand we might end up with 1D, but I think it's a good option. And I, I understand it's not the option that's north-south. The list that was given us, if the school committee can see that next week and make those decisions, if you notice the lighting isn't a 700,000, it's a smaller savings on each of these and fencing is smaller. If contingency is really listed too high, we get pretty close 
And what I worry about with taking contingency out is usually that's part of a design contingency. It's not just construction. There's some uncertainty because Kevin hasn't done all the, uh, the, the final piece of it, but, but we, need, we need that buffer. Um, so I don't know whether the buffer is set too high. So we're pretty close. And I think it's the school committee that's gonna have to look at this to say, are we close enough with the assurance that they can go back to CPA with discussions, not just with Amherst, but with the other three towns and leaving that them to do that over the next couple of weeks is what I would like to do, which is why I want to remove the restriction. I want to get an option that moves this year, um, not wait again for next year. Uh, I, I think this has been a very long delay, um, basically because we haven't had the money. And, and just so everyone knows, the amount, my estimate is what they have to ask the Amherst CPA for, CPAC, is about $800,000 if that extra million is right, you know, for the phasing. So, you know, we may well want to spend that money, but it's a big chunk of money out of our CPA. So it's vying with affordable housing, with, you know, some of the other things that CPA. So it's, it's something that we might all welcome, depending what else is on uh, the docket. Um, but it, it's, it's not like CPA is just this magic and they've got a, a big thing. So it, it's something we have to look at. And I would be totally for it as long as it doesn't push out something else. Kathy, thank you. George? Am I right in assuming that, and maybe this is a question for Kevin or maybe he can't answer it, but the presentation he just gave us now about 3C and the various ways in which uh, it could be, um, cost could be gotten and, and phasing could be done. Is that a presentation that will be made to the school committee next Tuesday? Not only that, but I need to have Kevin send those documents to Athena so that they can be placed in the record for tonight. Yeah, will do. Thank you. George? Um, yeah, I don't know about the presentation next week. I hadn't been asked. Um, this was the first I was hearing about it, but more than happy to give it. George, are there additional questions? Well, if, if I had some assurance, I mean, again, I, I want to uh, remove the restriction and let the school committee do its job. But and I'm also hearing overwhelmingly that the right decision is to um, option 3C. And if I had some confidence that this uh, case would be made in the strongest possible way to the school committee, combined with the very strong support from CPA, combined with what we've heard tonight from uh, many of the people in the athletic and sports community, then I would uh, somewhat reluctantly, but I would say let's remove the restriction and, and let the school committee make its decision. I think it is correct. They are the elected body and ultimately it is their call. Um, I would point out that the vast majority of the money that's going into this project is coming from CPA and from the town, from free cash. Um, so we do have a pretty large stake in this. But I hear the argument that um, it is, is ultimately their call. Um, but what's frustrating me is the sense that um, I don't have a clear, I just don't see that a case is going to be made on Tuesday. And they seem to be, they apparently have to make a decision about design. And I share uh, Mandy's fear that they will simply go with the, the, the middle option. And I think that would be a terrible loss. Um, so again, like Pat, my hand keeps going up and down. Um, Doug, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just, I'll, I'll share with you that I, that as far as the presentation that, that, that Kevin shared with you tonight, I'll share that with the school committee uh, next Tuesday. We'll do agenda setting a little later this week with the chair. And so, um, you know, we'll definitely have a robust conversation about this. I know that I would be uh, remiss not to sort of share this 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 conversation with them as well. And and I think that the I think the that like I said before, I think that my sense of the committee and I they haven't taken a formal vote on this. My sense of the committee is that they would like to do three C as well. Um, but they also I think that that. Uh, the urgency of 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 making the repairs and and doing the project is also pretty strong in their mind as well, which is part of why the urgency to sort of pose some questions. Um, I think as far as applying to CPA and other communities and and even even in Amherst, you know, the there are you know staff have to do that. There's limits on how many staff we have available to do that, or we would have been applying in the meantime. And we've only recently had the 
the feedback from the, the Amherst CPA that they'd be interested in funding enough, an additional amount of funds for that. For that, so it's a matter of, of uh, our staff here in the in the schools putting together those applications and getting them uh, uh, sent off to those those communities. I do know in in Leverett, Pell, and Shutesbury, their processes um, are typically winter and spring. Some of them don't even begin until January with with their review. Um, but happy to you know pose those questions earlier. I know the, who the chairs of each of those committees are, and and can talk to them and reach out to them, and happy to do that. When and I would say the same with the with school committee is that you know we we'd be reaching out uh, immediately to start the conversations with each of those CPACs and each of the four communities. Um, what I don't have a sense of from the from those other communities is is what uh, commitments they already have of their CPA dollars. So what their capacity is I just don't know. And I, I probably won't know by next Tuesday night either. Um, so that's that's another sort of question mark in the conversation uh, that happens. But but I'm happy to share, you know, this dialogue with with the school committee. And, and certainly I think they're they're um, hopefully move ahead with the three C. And I think that if we can find uh, some some ways to sort of structure how we do it in a way that that meets the funding that we know we have, plus uh, what we might be able to reasonably uh, acquire between now and and when we have to actually bid the projects, um, you know, we'll move ahead with three C if possible. But we do do need to give our designers an opportunity to kind of do their design. Thank you, Jennifer. My concern is that if we don't lift the restriction, we will get one B. And is that correct? They have that money now. If we don't lift the restriction, they can choose that option I just want to be clear yes they have 1.7 million right so I really hope we could have 3c but I would much prefer 1d to 1b and I feel like we're forcing if we don't lift the restriction we are maybe forcing them into that corner Andy yeah I think that from the it's finance committee meeting one thing that I thought about very strongly was the statement of CPA committee chair McLeod. I mean, he couldn't have been more firm about his um, projection as to where CPA would go if it got a proposal that they didn't, you know, they didn't lightly say we encourage the proposal and we will take it up out of our normal schedule which we know that they have done before. They did, I believe, with Kendrick Park. So that there's a lot of um, strong statement that was made that gives me uh, confidence. I also um, have not heard a single member of the school committee saying that they had anything as their first choice if the funds were available other than 3C. They really want the north-south track, and I haven't heard any of them say that uh, that isn't something that they believe strongly in. Um, and I guess the last thing that I keep thinking about is, you know, just my knowledge of the other towns and uh, how their procedures go. Unlike uh, Amherst, where we have a year-round government and can vote at any time to um, allocate borrowing from CPA if there's a recommendation from the CPA committee to do it. The other towns do have to go through special town meeting process. It is a much slower process, which then gets into the questions that we so carefully asked of Kevin uh, from um, the consulting firm about the delays, which have already been strongly spoken about tonight and don't need repetition, but that gives us the ability to say those things can be put off until we hear from the other towns um, as to whether they have the capacity to go forward um, and then reevaluate if there's not sufficient support because they don't have available funds or some other problem occurs in their CPA committees or special town meetings. So I do think that we have a very solid path forward and I hope we end up with votes 
tonight that encouraged the school committee to um, do what uh, Doug Slaughter suggest, um, was saying is that uh, he would be prepared to get an application into our CPA committee, but he needs direction from his school committee. And I think from what I know, he's gonna get it. Anna. So two questions. The first is um, the difference between 1B and 1D is the lighting and the rejuvenated field. Is that primarily correct, Kevin, I think is? Yeah, that's that's correct. It's so, uh, use, utilizing existing drainage versus all new and uh, all new light pole system. Okay. And are those elements of the project that could also be hypothetically phased in over time with external CPA funds? Um, the, lighting, you don't have to answer the CPA part, but yeah, is no, that the, something the that lighting, we can go back uh, to? The new drainage, though, no. Under the new okay. north-south, that would have to go in at this time of the field. Okay. So I think my question is... Um, my rhetorical question for the council, not rhetorical. If, if folks have answers, I always want to hear them, but I don't, if we're so confident in this path forward, if we are, people are saying they have confidence in 3C happening if we lift the restrictions because they believe the funds will be available. If we're so confident, if we have a solid path forward, why remove the restrictions? Why not stay the course? I think that what people keep saying is they believe this is going to happen. They believe this is going to happen. I personally do not believe that this will happen within the time frame indicated by the school committee that they feel they need to make this decision firmly by, which is next week. I still haven't actually heard someone explain to me how what's going to change in the next week that's going to prove that those funds are are available and lead the school committee to go for, for 3C. Uh, I'm still open to hearing that. But if we have this solid path forward, why not stay the course? If we go with 1B or 1D, we are negating all of the work that's done on the field's master plan. We are losing an opportunity for adding an actual playing field that doesn't exist right now, taking out open green space and turning it into an actual field, reorganizing, and following through on what we spent 50 grand uh, to develop a plan to do. So I just, why are we not staying the course if we feel so confident in this? Um, yeah. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded. The motion on the table, which will show on the screen, is with all of the notifications, it is to approve the CPAC motion to rescind the restrictions on the north-south orientation in council order FY23-08A with a strong recommendation to pursue the north-south option and encourage the regional school committee to return to CPAC for additional funds to meet the north-south objective. If you vote no, it means you don't remove the restriction. If you vote yes, it means you remove the restriction. Point of order. Yes. If this was originally a borrowing authorization, which I think it was. It was. What is the vote quantum to change the authorization? Uh, Two thirds. So this will need nine yeses. That's correct. Okay. Because it's a borrowing authorization, our borrowing authorization requires nine votes. The CPA money was not a direct cash. It had to be borrowed. Does that? Yeah, please. But this doesn't change the amount that C CPAC is talking about. It simply talks about um, the use of it. I, I hear your question. You're saying it doesn't change the amount, so why we are not changing the amount to borrow. Anna, I mean, Athena, do you want to? So um, a motion to rescind or amend something previously adopted, um, it requires the same vote quantum as the original vote okay. to adopt the order that's in the council rules. Thanks. 
And in that case, it was nine. Thank you very much. All right, are we ready? Again, you vote yes, you remove the restriction. If you vote no, you don't remove the restriction. Okay. And we're going to begin with Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Councilor Ette. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a reluctant yes. Councilor Haneke. No. The motion passes with a vote of 10 in favor and three opposed. We're moving on to the next motion. Having been reviewed by the Finance Committee in a report dated June 17th, 2024, been published on the Town Bulletin Board for a minimum of 10 days on June 7th, 2024, and the Council having held a public forum on June 17th, 2024, 2024 in accordance with Charter Section 5.6 to remove the North-South Orientation Restriction on Council Order FY 23-05C, which appropriated $900,000 in free cash toward the project. Is there a second? Shane seconds. And now I want to ask, what is the vote quantum? Um, an appropriation of free cash is just a majority vote. It's not It's not a borrowing, so it's not a two-thirds vote. It's a majority vote. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the motion's been made and seconded. Are there questions? Alicia. Um, yes, I just have a question about that determination. So even though this isn't exactly to borrow, it's just to move the restrictions, would it still be the same numbers? It, because it's it, not, they're not technically. It, right, and I, I'm trying to read, are you asking about the vote quantum or are you asking about yeah. the figure? The, about in the this case, the town, the clerk of the town council has said that the vote was not for borrowing and it was only a majority. Okay, thank you. Okay. A, a majority of councilors present. So right now that's the it, full council. There are 13 of us present, so it's seven. That's right. Okay. All right, we begin the vote in this case with Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelis. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. No. The motion passes. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Bob Hagner. Yes. Thank you. I, my check mark was too big. Um, Change my vote to a no. Please. Yes. Okay. Councillor. DeAngelis is asked to change her vote to nay. Uh, the motion passes, 10 in favor, three opposed. And we will go on to the final one. And that is Would you put the motion on the screen, please? It is, it is. thank you. Having been reviewed by the Finance Committee in a report dated June 17th, 2024, been published on the Town Bulletin Board for a minimum of 10 days on June 7th, 2024, and the Council having held adoption, having held a public forum on June 17th in accordance with Charter Section 5.6 to not adopt approval, appropriation, and transfer order FY 24-03B, an order approving the towns of Amherst 
free gift to the Amherst Re Pelham Regional High School District of $756,160 from free cash for the high school track and field project for the North-South Orientation Design Option 3C. And the council strongly recommends it the regional school to committee to pursue the north-south option through CPA funding through the four towns. Is there a second? Ryan, so, second. Okay. Are there questions? This one is a no. So if you don't, Kathy, go ahead. That's just what I was going to say. If you say yes to this, it means don't use free cash for this. Right. It's an oddly worded one, but it means go somewhere else for the money. Right. I.e., CPA. It's and, explicitly. And Bob. Yeah, I just wanted to remind people that uh, there was two reasons why the. Sorry. There were two reasons why. Uh, just remind everyone there were two reasons why we voted this way, um, to to not adopt approval, and one is that. If we use free cash, we can't use CPA funding to back to backfill it. And secondly, we really felt strongly that if this should be a shared cost among the four towns, not something that Amherst paid for itself. Thank you, Bob. Are there any other comments or questions? Andy. Yeah, there was one additional reason that I had for not wanting to use free cash, and that is that while we did do it once before, I don't think it's a good practice. And because in the end, what we have for free cash, um, if we don't use it for other purposes, um, it always goes into the capital stabilization fund. And given our need for so many things in capital, um, not the least of which, of course, are roads and sidewalks, but I'm gonna mention one other, which is fire station. And the reason I mentioned fire station is that the last time we had a financial projection from our former finance director, Sean Mangano, about um, the options for moving forward with other projects, um, one of his strong suggestions was to use um, a large or all um, uh, capital stabilization to fund the fire station so we could get forward, move forward with that project without having to borrow any money and then um, use it for the other, for other projects. Um, for those reasons, I was uh, very uncomfortable with the proposal to take it uh, from free cash. And then uh, of course, when I uh, heard from uh, Chair Mc Sam McLeod from CPA committee, um, then that gave me additional feeling that um, this was wrong. And so I encouraged the yes vote to say, no, don't use the, those funds. Councilor Haneke. Just, I mentioned it briefly in a prior discussion um, on a prior motion, but the other item is our financial guidelines also strongly encourage all town departments, and I know the regional school isn't technically a town of Amherst department, but it's a, you know, still comes to us, but we encourage all of our town departments to apply to CPA for any project that is CPA eligible first, so that we're using those funds for those projects to free up other revenues for projects that are not CPA eligible. And so this, this financial order actually goes against that, that sort of guideline that we have too. Um, and so I just wanna remind our school committee members, go to CPA and phase. <laughs> first, first, <laughs> yes, phase. Go out to your CPA and also your donors. Okay, uh, we're gonna begin the vote with Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Uh, I mean, uh, Councilor Ryan. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councilor Ryan. Ryan. Quite all right. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelos. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Yes. Lynn Griesmers and I. Councillor Haneke. Aye. 
Bob Hagner. Yes. Councilor Lord. Aye. It's unanimous. Okay. We are going to take a much needed break. Uh, we will be back at nine. Uh, I hate to do this. <laughs> we'll be back at nine twenty. <laughs> Please turn your mics off and also your video off. Lynn, would you mind saying what agenda item we're going to come back with? Would you please say which agenda item we're going to begin with when we come back? The water and sewer updates. Thank you.
We need to start reassembling. To return, please put put your video back on. As you return, please put your video back on. So Guilford Mooring is with us, and although we have voted the gauge water supply, there are a few quick updates that we're going to have on water and sewer. And please note, we are not voting water and sewer rates until um, July 15th, and we have checked to make sure that that still allows proper billing. I'm also going to um amend the agenda for tonight by postponing until next week uh, the appointment of the charter review committee this will allow the chair to write a memo and we're going to postpone i, I think that's all we're postponing we'll see okay so uh guilford please proceed Hi, uh, Amy Rizeki is actually going to give these updates. So if you can let her in the. I'm meeting. here. Okay. Hi, Amy. Hi. <laughs> I must have just been on uh, page two of the screen. Um, for those of you guys that are newer counselors, I think I don't, I haven't had a chance to present in front of a couple of you guys. So um, I'm Amy Rizeki and I'm the assistant superintendent of public works. Um, 
And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully gonna go through this quickly, um, but just a couple of updates on some um, water specific items that um, just, I need, I need you guys as town counselors to be aware of. Um, so the first one is water use restrictions, which um, those of you guys that were on the town council last year um, recall um, that we've had a lot of conversation about the fact that um, we were going to need to start enacting water use restrictions. So um, just a little bit of a history. Um, we are allowed to provide water as a public water supplier based on the fact that we have both a registration with the state and a permit, which I get sounds confusing, but it basically means the state has two different ways that they can put governances on us or put restrictions on how we provide water. Um, currently, we just got our water registration. So one aspect of how we're allowed to get water, we just got that renewed in 2023. Um, and that is what has now placed the fact that we need to do water, uh, water restrictions um, for outdoor use during times of drought. Um, the permit um, is going to be updated. I was on a meeting earlier today. It's probably going to be updated in about the timeline of 2026 or 2027. At that time, the conditions of when we say, hey, people have to start restricting their outdoor usage, that might change. So understand that in a few years, this might change. But for now, I'm just going to go over what our water registration is requiring us to do um, during the summer for um, restrictions. So Athena, if you can go to the next page. Uh, you skipped one, go back, I think. There we go. Um, so our registration, we're covered under 310 CMR 36 for in terms of our registration. And the restrictions, this is the broad strokes of it, but they're basically saying that when the state, so when the secretary of the state declares different levels of drought, we are going to have to react by doing different levels of water use restrictions in the town. Um, and so during a level one, a mild drought, uh, we're just going to have to do that. We're going to have to say that people are only allowed to water their lawns or do any non-essential watering one day a week and outside of the hours of nine to five. So we'll have to designate one day a week that is the watering day, I guess. Um, during a level two, so a significant drought, if they declare that for our region, um, then all non-essential water uses are banned. There's a couple of limitations, a couple of carve, that, carve outs that I'll talk about. And then level three, which is a critical drought, or level four, um, all non-essential water uses are banned. And there's no limitation, like there's no little carve outs on that. It's just none of it's allowed. Um, so again, this is going to be applied when the secretary makes a declaration and they're going to be lifted when the secretary lifts the declaration for our region. Um, and we're required to comply with this immediately, which is why I'm talking to you guys now, because this is something we're going to have to follow this summer. Um, there are additional components to this in terms of enforcement and documenting enforcement um, that we have to have fully in place by April of 2025. And so that's what we're going to be kind of working through this summer. Uh, I think if you can go to the next slide. So just in terms of what is an essential outdoor water use and a non-essential outdoor water use, um, I guess I'm stealing something from that last order where I'm saying the non-essential uses are anything that aren't the things below, kind of the double negative. Um, the things below or the things that are listed here are basically the what the state considers an essential outdoor water use. So it's uh, if it's watering for health or safety reasons, so that means cooling shelter, such as the, the splash pad that we have in town, pools that we have in town. Um, if we put up a cooling shelter, uh, say later this week with all the heat, um, that would be a health or safety reason. Um, production of food, so you know, um, gardens or you know, large farms, uh, livestock, um, they do have a carve out for core functions of the business, and they're saying that's for plant nurseries, golf courses, um, wedding venues, 
Um, you'll see that there's limitations with that. So it's not that a golf course can just say, well, I'm a golf course, I can do whatever. There, there are still some limitations, but they have a little more freedom than um, somebody watering their lawn. Um, and then there's also irrigation of public parks, irrigation of shade trees, and um, publicly funded shade trees, so the town shade trees, um, and establishing a new lawn if you've just like finishing construction. So a lot of these, there are kind of so, uh, some limitations, but this is the broad strokes of um, what the state thinks are essential water usage that are um, outside of those level one drought, one day a week, level two drought, no, no outdoor watering. Um, next slide, Athena. Um, and then I just want to kind of, again, go back to a year ago, if folks recall, um, when we enacted the water use regulations um, in section 1.d, um, we put, we knew that this was coming. And so we put in language to cover this. And so this is a language that we put in that basically said, we have the right to restrict water use during dry seasons or during other emergencies. And at times this may be due to mandatory compliance because of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that that's essentially what I'm talking about here is the state is requiring us under certain circumstances to follow their prescribed plan. Um, and then we do have language about um, it may include fines and um, after proper notice, we can shut off water if people have violated it. Um, that second part, the reason that I have that a little further down, that's the portion that um, we're going to spend, I think, this summer and the rest of this year trying to figure out how we can even put systems in place to be in a place that we could, you know, enforce, document, find any of that. So in, at least in terms of this year, um, we don't we don't fully know how we're going to um how we're going to do the second part of that, but at least in terms of having restrictions, getting the language out there, um, and following that, that part of it is what we're going to do this year. So that was my quick water use restrictions. I don't know, Lynn, if you want me to go through all of my topics, or do you want me to pause on this and take questions? Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to mention uh, three things. One, this all the groundwork that you did a couple of years ago, especially Anna um, mm -hmm. has set, and uh, Amy was ahead of the curve on this. So that's this sets the base. So when this came in, we were ready to act on it. The second, this is you know the water use restrictions are coming from someplace else. It's not. It may be perfectly green and uh, verdant here, but it's it, it doesn't matter if the decision is made someplace else. And third, the reason we want you to hear this in a public meeting is because this impacts everybody. It's some it's the type of thing that riles people up if they can't water their 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 gardens or their grass. And you will hear about it when and we're not even in the enforcement stage this year, but we we're gonna be required to be there. So that's why it was important enough to bring to your attention tonight. Okay. Thank you. Um Amy, please proceed. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. I'm sorry. Question. Yeah, I, I think you explained it well, but I believe in past years, uh, the council's never done it, but the select board as water commissioners used to put in the restrictions. And so this supersedes that. I believe that was the biggest change that we made in the, yeah when we updated the, the regulations a couple of years ago, um, was this, that switch that the council approved. When we updated no, the I, I'm not questioning it. I'm just like confirming it because people yeah, used to be yeah. like, well, the, the select board did it. And yeah, the no, would no do it and, confirming yeah. that that yeah. was what um, that was the change that was made. And um, Anna, you had your hand up. Yeah. Amy, can you go back to the um, first off? Thank you for this. This is very thorough and helpful. Can you go back to the slide that had golf courses on it? Yeah. Thank you. This is a curiosity question. I'm sorry. I, I know people love when I have curiosity questions at 930 at night. Um, so, okay. So the part, okay. Health and safety, production of food, livestock, public parks. Um, that's the one that I was, I was stuck on. So I know that limitations apply. Sure. Does public parks also include athletic fields, say at a school? 
I'm going to assume yes, but I can, I'm, I'm, I There's have it right here. So, okay. I can look um, it up myself too. I, I was trying, but I figured you might be faster. I think that's what I was trying to figure out was as we think about the recreational it says, fields. It says public, public parks and public recreational fields. So okay. yes. Thank you so much. Yes. And just to address Mandy Joe's question or not, I guess, comment, um, part of the reason that we took the town, the town council out, out of this decision-making process is just because at times when the state says, Hey, Connecticut, Connecticut river Valley, you guys are in a level one drought. We have to be reactionary as of when they did that. And so there wasn't necessarily going to be the time to have you guys, um, confirm that. And, and so we, that's, that's why it was written that way. Thank you. Um, Continue on, please. Okay. So next, uh, we're going to talk. Yeah, we've talked about this is the summer, my summer of 2016. It was the summer where we, the first time that in my time here that we declared a drought, we had all that fun. And then the other fun was that we tested for lead and copper at all the elementary schools and got to talk our way through lead and copper rule. Um, so that's, this is, that's the other part of what I'm talking about today. Um, so, um, I guess if you can go to the next slide, Athena. Um, so this is more an update for you guys, but this is a, a pretty big project and a pretty big federal requirement that we're under right now is, um, part of the lead and copper rule. This is in the aftermath of Flint, Michigan and everything that happened, um, the federal requirement or the, the federal, uh, the EPA, um, did some revisions to the lead and copper rule. And a big component of that is that they're requiring us to do an inventory of water service lines throughout our system. And so we're having to systematically identify the components of every single water, sis, uh, water line in our entire water system, um, the water service lines. Uh, it's about 10,000, if anyone was curious. So we're having to systematically confirm 10,000 uh, service lines, it's great. Um, and one of the changes from what we initially thought was going to apply is that um, the EPA is requiring us to do an inventory regardless of who owns the service line. And so even depend, it, it didn't even matter if the town owns it or if the property owner owns it or anything, we have to be submitting to them information on the entirety of the service line from where it leaves the water main to where it goes into, goes through concrete into a basement. Um, and this is due in October 2024. So this has been a, a major project that we've kind of been picking away at for a while, and now we're moving full steam ahead um, this summer. So if you can do the next slide. Um, and the information that they're looking for, particularly, um, they need the material type. Um, so it can be copper, plastic, galvanized lead. It could be a whole long list. Um, they want to know the size, the installation date, and they also want to know the building type. Um, I think they're going to look a lot more closely at, you know, houses, you know, single family, multifamily houses, and also school and child care centers, and maybe not be as concerned about service lines in places that are non-residential installations. Um, and then there's some additional parameters, but these are kind of the big things that we have to identify for all of these 10,000 service lines. If you can go to the next slide. So how we are tackling this. Um, we're reviewing all of the documents that we have, which is water service cards. Um, anybody who has a water line to their house, um, I, maybe I should say 90% of the people that have water lines to their house, there's a little index card that exists that at least has a sketch of where we can find um, the shutoff outside and where it attaches to the water main. But on a lot of them, it does also have what the material is, what the size is, when it was installed, and some, um, frankly, some really humorous notes as well on uh, <laughs> some of the history of them. Um, but we're looking at that. We're also looking at construction plans and permits. Um, and then for the colleges, you know, some of these big numbers come from the fact that we also have to do this for, say, every single building on UMass campus, where it leaves the large water main to where it goes through the concrete in the foundation on that, um, on every single building on UMass campus. So we're working closely with um, Hampshire College, Amherst College, and UMass to um, complete the inventory on their campuses. 
the hard part is there's often details missing. And so part of why I'm coming to you guys is that we're going to be needing all of our residents to be uh, contributing to this solution. <laughs> so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, where, where we're gonna need support over the next month, we're going to be setting out um, a mailer to folks, um, to anyone who has a property in Amherst that gets town water. Um, and there's going to be this quick five minute survey where it's going to direct you to go into your basement, find your water line. It tells you how to find your water meter. And then it runs you through a couple of quick tests that you can identify the material and the size, and you can click a photo and then send it off to us. Um, the more people that do this, the more we can fill in those blanks. Um, the way the EPA is seeing it, anytime you have a blank, if things are unconfirmed, they're going to always assume the worst case scenario. So we want to fill in as many blanks as possible so that ultimately when, you know, kind of phase two of this, after we submit our inventory, we're going to have to go back and start filling in those gaps, you know, identifying the things that were unknown. Um, I prefer to be able to be focusing on the places that really do have problems and that are most likely having lead. And so as many of these as many residents as possible that can complete this survey and send us information, that's gonna be really valuable for us to hone in on the areas that that really need us to be um, you know, doing the next step. So um, yeah, and then I, I just put a note in here. We understand that in the town of Amherst, there's oftentimes the property owner is not the same as the person living in the house. And so there will be a notification that goes to the property owner if they're not living in the house to let them know what's going on so that they can encourage whomever's in the house to complete this survey and get us the information. Um, Athena, if you can go to the next slide. Um, this is just a quick snapshot, um, but I, I wanted to show it more just to show like we're not hanging you guys out to dry and expecting everyone to be an expert in what a water line looks like. And so this is you know step two, there's three steps in this. One, find the meter, two, determine the material, and three, um, determine the size. So this is, you know, the hardest part is determining the material. And we step you through it um, with a quick, does a magnet stick to it or not? Um, what color is it? And can I scratch it with the key? Um, using, you know, those three things, you can pretty easily determine what the material is. So um, we're trying to make this as easy as possible so that nobody has to be an expert, but everyone can be super helpful and useful in this process. Um, I think I have one more slide, Athena. Yes, no, okay. No, that's it on the service line inventory. So I don't know if anyone has any questions on this quick update. Kathy? I don't really have a question, although it's a fully a mammoth task. So I, one comment I might be is, I don't imagine the federal government's helping you pay for all of this, um, requiring it. But uh, the friendlier, I think you're already doing that with this, but the friendlier this can be when it comes into somebody's house, the better. And um, if you can post these, we can get this out as a note to people to anticipate these coming and that this isn't an invasion of your property. And if they don't do this, you would have to go into their house. Is that correct? Yeah, if it's if it's still an unknown and it's, you know, of certain time periods that we suspect it might be led, then that's going to be the follow up is we're going to have to confirm. So we're either going to have to go into their basement or if that's not allowed, then we may have to dig up their front lawn to be able to physically see a service line, which I can't imagine anyone wants. Um, so yeah, Kathy, in terms of getting the word out, um, honestly, I would have just put a link in here, but I've been advised that, um, at least when it comes to these public forums that anyone can access, um, because of cybersecurity, we don't want to do that and get a lot of false information, but I'm happy to share the link with town councilors. If you want to get it out to your, um, the people within your districts to, to spread the word and encourage them to do it. Um, we're just, we're trying to kind of balance, making sure that we're not that, that we're doing this in the, the cyber secure way and not inviting a lot of um, kind of bot answers, if that makes sense. Thank you. 
Bob. Um, I just want to note that there is this federal paperwork reduction act, which does limit the ability of anybody to file to do a survey. So make sure you're not violating that act. Um, secondly, are you going to have a helpline for people to call because there'll be people who just can't manage to do this on their own? Yes. Um, so with, with all of this, people can call the public works department. Um, I, yeah, but I would just add one other thing and that is there's a large number of vacant houses in the summer in Amherst because they're rentals and nobody's home. That's one question. But the other question is, uh, district two has a, probably most of the people in town who are not on the public water system. And yet they may have in their own plans, because some of these are very old houses, um, some of these more de less desirable pipes and so forth. Is there any attempt to inventory that? So this one is just, um, this federal regulation is on us as a water supplier to understand the, the people that we serve. Um, so it's not necessarily covered by that, but I mean, that's a, that's a great point. Um, we've seen with stuff like PFOS that a lot of times after they, you know, approach the water regular, uh, water suppliers to do something, they often then follow up with how they can start to do the same thing for private well owners. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if something like that followed up, but it might also be a good conversation to have with the, the board of health if they, you know, want to partner on. Um, something like that to to look at the safety of that as well. My only other comment is I just see cha-ching, cha-ching. This is an expensive project. Yes. Wow. George. So we have a, a sizable elder population and uh, some of them at least are homeowners. So I'm just wondering if you um, will be working with the senior center and if that you see that as a concern. Uh, so you this will come to some folks and they simply won't be physically able perhaps to do this or they might have need help. So I just wondered about that. All right. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're um we're gonna be we're talking about this with you know people throughout the town so we can find a way to make this be as effective as possible. So thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on to what oh George, you still have your hand up. I think it's you're done. Okay, water meters. Two seconds on this. This is more my PSA is just while I'm here talking to you guys, um, as you guys know, we've been um, working on updating um, or replacing all water meters um, that um, we started this in 2014. Um, and so basically this is part of, it's gonna be part of the cool thing of the service line inventory as people are sending us photos of their meter and of their water service line. We're gonna be able to tell if they have an, old style, which is like the one on the left, or if they have a newer style, which is the one on the right. Um, the difference is if you're not someone who likes to play the game of what's different between the two photos, um, it's really that gray box that's attached to the left-hand side of the meter. Um, that's that's the difference. And that's that allows us to um, read the meters remotely from the exterior without you having to have something installed to the outside of your house that gets torn off when you do the siding or um, stuff like that. So um, if you're unsure about your property, um, I just encourage folks to call the DPW office to determine if you need an up, um, a replacement or not um, and to schedule an appointment. So that's all I have on that. And I'll take any, any other questions? questions or I'll let you move on. <laughs> I, we're all in... Thank you very much, Amy, and um, good luck. Thank you. I appreciate you guys giving me a couple of minutes. I know you have a very packed schedule, but thank you very much. It's clearly, um, we probably should record this section of the meeting and put it out. Um, all right. Uh, we The next two items also involve uh, DPW, so we're going to go with them, and that is uh, a motion as recommended by Town Services and Outreach Committee to adopt Massachusetts General Law Chapter 90, Paragraph 17C, which will reduce the statutory speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour 
for roads in thickly settled or business districts without other posted speed limits. Is there a second? Second, D'Angelo. Okay. Um, this was an item discussed and comes to us from TSO. So Andy, I'm going to go to TSO. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that the report, I wrote it so that it would be pretty clear explanation, but, you know, because the whole system of uh, establishing speed limits is one of the least understood and more complex processes. And I tried to um, do some explanation with the committee report and the attachments to it. But basically, um, very simple piece is that uh, for current speed limits that are not um, marked otherwise, um, there's a presumption that uh, in most areas of town, it's a 30 mile an hour speed limit in a lot of streets, uh, res both residential that are fairly uh, tightly packed, uh, reasonably tightly packed as far as frequency of housing in, in business areas um, it are on that 30 mile an hour. There is what the statute and this option provides is the reduction of that um, by five miles an hour. And um, if we as a committee, having um, received fair amount of uh, input from various uh, sources uh, felt that the appropriate thing is to do a number of neighboring communities, including Northampton have done, which is to change that default from 30 to 25. And that uh, uh, we uh, therefore voted uh, to make that proposal uh, to recommend that to the council. Um, otherwise, I think that it would be best to just respond to questions. Kathy? Um, I am totally in favor of this. So I just have a question. If there is a posted speed limit and it doesn't make sense, you know, um, and one example is we have an intersection in North Amherst that if you turn one way, it says 30. Another way, it says 35. A third way, it says 25, all from a short distance from where you're standing. Um, so, and they are posted. So this would not apply to that, correct? We would have to then say to whomever came up with those. And then, so that's a question. And then secondly, this definition of... Um, Thickly settled versus somewhat thickly settled and 30 and 40. Again, um, if there's been development along the road where um, more a complex is coming in, at what point is it more like a thickly settled as opposed to not quite as thickly settled? Um, and I, I have specific roads in mind. So so it's this is only where it's not posted, correct? To get a change in posting, we have to do something at the state level. And do we have to do it on non-state roads and then differently on state roads? Because we have a state road in North Amherst. Um, Route 63 is state. So I know anything that happens there, we have to go to them. Guilford, I'm going to call on you because you're shaking your head. I'm agreeing. Um, yes, if we have a road that's posted and they don't agree, we have to go through the long process of getting the doing a traffic study and proposing a new a new regulation for those roads. That's how you do it. If it's a town road, it's only a town way town process, but it still has to go to the state. If it's a state road like 63, it's a town and state process, and then it goes to be approved. Okay, Mandy Joe. Councillor Haneke, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, a couple of questions. And 
Um, I apologize to the council. I've been seeking a map of speed limits from Andy. And then I realized way back in 2020, I might have created one for um, CRC when this was referred to CRC. And so I've been trying to get through Paul whether the one that's on my computer is accurate to try and figure out what roads were here. So I might refer to that map with some of my questions, but um, or with some of my comments. But um, the TSO report seems to have a conflict. So I'm going to also try and confirm some of what um, Kathy just said. In one section, it says, voting this would reduce the statutory speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour on any and all or all town owned roadways within a thickly settled or business district that is not governed by regulatory speed limits. So I think what Kathy said was, is it understanding that if it's got a speed limit sign posted, this, this vote has no effect on the road is what that st statement says. Um, but then it also said like, three sentences later, state-owned roadways and any roads that are presently governed by a regulatory speed limit, so non-posted roads, um, that it would not apply to state-owned roads or any road that is presently governed by a regulatory speed limit, limit, generally a posted speed limit other than 30 miles per hour will not be affected by adopting this section, which to me when I read implies that if it is posted as 30 miles per hour, this would apply. And that would directly conflict with the statement before that says if there's any posting, it doesn't apply. So I guess I'm trying to figure out whether if a road is posted as 30, like actually posted as 30, and we vote this, does that automatically go down to 25? Because the statement made in the TSO report seems to imply that it might, even though other statements said it wouldn't. And then once that's answered, can I? Ask some of my other questions. Andy. Yeah, no, this is very difficult to write. Um, and the word generally has an ambiguity to it. And uh, the, the, the problem that um, exists is that if a road is posted at 30 miles an hour, was it posted at 30 miles an hour because the default speed limit applies to that road or had we gone through a process and gotten permission to post it as a 30 mile an hour and that isn't entirely clear um, it's my understanding that we may actually even have to go back to uh, have, have the town engineer go back to the files to see if there's any um, action that was taken on the road that is exceptional, and that those are paper files and, and require some searching for each one. So um, it, it is a little bit of an ambiguity on that one piece is if it's posted as 30, why is it posted as 30? Um, thank you. Uh, Cameron, it, it's now getting clear as mud. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question, which we're also trying to bat around, is is if we do an umbrella twenty five mile an hour speed limit, do we have any control over? It sounds like not. Um, posting certain areas at different speeds than twenty five. It sounds like a whole lot of work. What are the what are the overall benefits of? Um, it sounds like a really good idea because I'd like to see twenty five miles an hour speed limits in more areas. But what are we what do we actually accomplish? Mandy Joe. So so my next questions. Um, Beyond trying to, that, that question was trying to go to, I'm trying to figure out exactly what roads this would affect um, because I don't like voting on something when I don't know what would act, what we're actually voting on. Um, and so the next question I have is, thickly settled is a specific definition of a quarter mile long section of road. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples, station road, um, Flat Hills Road and uh, Pulpit Hill Road 
if we vote this, is it the entire road or is it only the portion that might equate to the thickly settled section? Since uh, Station Road has a large section that would not meet the thickly settled definition by any definition, is it all of it or is it only the thickly settled sections of this? And then how does a driver determine at what point without sign postings that that speed limit changes from a default of 40 potentially to a default of 25? And then my next question is more for probably Chief Ting and the police department than Guilford. Um, are there any funds to enforce a new definite, a, a new speed limit down at 25? Or are we basically um, doing this to feel good because just changing a number doesn't change drivers' actions unless there's some other change to either enforcement or the look of the road? So obviously Guilford's not going to answer the second question, but let's go for the first question. I'll do the second one too, but the first one is um, what's generally is being considered by most communities is when they import, when they put this in place is that if there's not a speed limit sign, then it's the default of 25. And some communities are actually putting up um, in the speed zone signs to end the speed zone, which we could do that to tell people, you know, in, in 40, in 40 miles an hour. And then anything after that would be um, the default, but it is kind of vague. And the, what you get out of doing this is you get the basic saying of, is you got to slow down when you're in this community is 25. There is another option in this law, which allows you to do it for individual streets. And when you do it for individual streets, you actually then put the sign up on the street that says thickly settled 25 miles an hour. So then you're being more def definitive on what you're actually calling the 25. Um, but most communities have taken the broad brush approach and even mass DOT is encouraging people to take the broad brush, brush approach and saying that if it's not posted something else, it's 25. And then it's falling to the police department, which I won't answer that second part. Okay, uh, George. So enforcement obviously is, is a crucial element, just as we all know, just passing this is not going to really have that much impact. Um, but I think it sends an important message and it's a message that I think it's important that we send. Um, I hope it's also the first in a series of things we'll do over the next few years that will address the issue of speeding, traffic calming, pedestrian safety, et cetera. Um, some of these things have already come before TSO. I'm hoping that is something TSO will continue to pursue. Um, but in a sense, it is, I don't know about feel good. I guess obviously we will feel good if we do it. Um, but it's, I think, also sending a message. And I think that message is one that it's important. Um, post COVID, we're seeing speeding as a recurring issue. Um, we do need more enforcement. Um, we do need, in certain places, perhaps things done to the road to discourage speeding. Um, but I think this is a first step. So I encourage us to do it. Um, with the hope that many other things are going to follow in the future. Okay. Kathy? I, yeah, I, just two comments. Um, Guilford, when you said what other towns have done, I've seen on the Levert on Plum Trees, it says Levert's a 25 mile an hour speed. And Mandy, that would be a good example of a road that wouldn't be called th thickly settled. They just said, this is what we've done. And when... Uh, a bunch of us succeeded in lowering the speed limit when you come into Amherst on Route 63, which is the state road. We petitioned the state. They lowered it, not as low as we wanted, but to 45 with a blinking light that tells you your speed. People slowed down. They used to go 60. Now they go 50, which is better than 60. I mean, they did they did slow down. You can hear the brakes get hit because they hit that. Um, so it... I just want to encourage people, if you're on a stay road, it is possible to get it changed. So we're going to try again. Andy? Yeah, I, I think that what we were recognizing at TSO was that um, it would have an educational effect and it would also enable police department, if they had the resources, to patrol a street that they're concerned about and to 
apply the uh, and enforce the 25 mile an hour limit. And uh, so certain, you know, there's a benefit to giving the police department that option when it has the resources and the priority to do so. And I think that uh, speaking from the finance committee role that I play for a second, uh, and we do have to recognize that the police department does have its limits during the hearing process when we were doing hearings on the budget. Uh, one of the questions that was asked of Chief Ting was about the size of the department and uh, basically, uh, you know, his comment was that if there were more officers, that there are a lot of things that the police department could do that it's unable to do with the size of the force that it has now. And uh, one of them was uh, traffic. And uh, the, um, it's not that he said that they don't do traffic, but they would able to do more regular traffic and community policing was another thing that he talked about at that response. Yeah. But I, I think that the TSO feeling was is that um, lowering the speed limit is something we need to do for safety for road users. And road users are not just people in, in vehicles, but also include bicyclists and pedestrians, including some of the uh, uh, fifth graders who came and testified before us about why they need to have a safe route school for bicycling. Thank you, Anna. So, uh, Guilford, please always correct me if I'm wrong. So counting on you to, to explain why I'm wrong if I am wrong, but I don't see any harm in this, but I do think to kind of echo what other folks have said, it's important to be realistic about the scale of change that this actually is. Um, relative to how amazing it sounds to say we're lowering speed limits. Uh, I, I think I just, I wanna be realistic about the actual impact and scope of this because I think the other issue that we have is the roads that, uh, I think it was, I don't remember whose point it was, but the roads that have shifted, right? The number of people that have changed on these roads since the speed limits have, have been established. I think that that's something I would love to see TSO also, and I know that you'll have plenty on your plate, but I think that seems like the sister move to this, right? The next move is to say, how do you get a road re, how do you reclassify a road to reestablish? Or I know that, you know, the, the state has the process of how to go about changing the full speed limit, but in order to reclassify some of our streets that I'd argue, I, I agree with, was it Jennifer or Kathy? Sorry, whoever made the point of, of populations shifting. Um, I agree that we need to make sure we're able to reclassify areas as thickly settled or not. But when I look at that map, um, not Mandy's map, but the there's an MIT map of speed limits through town. And you know this will really impact, hypothetically, would impact some of the roads slightly adjacent to downtown, hypothetically. I can't overlay this with our um, zoning map, which is, I think, what Mandy might be trying to do. But um, the realistic impact of this is is relatively small compared to the problem we have. And so while I think this is a good step, or at least I don't see a downside to this, um, so why not? I think that there's more if we actually wanna get at the, the issues that we're having with speeding throughout the town. Are there any other comments or questions? I'm gonna move to a vote. I believe we're starting with Councillor Ryan? Great. Okay, go. Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Todd? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Pat Angelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gotham? Aye. Uh, Councillor Rette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. May Councillor Haneke? No. Uh, Bob Hegner? Yes. Councillor Lord? Aye. Motion passes 12. Pam Rooney. Pam Rooney, yes. I'm sorry. Who did I skip? Pam, Pam Rooney, I'm sorry. Pam. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes 12 in favor, one opposed. 
Uh, the set next uh, motion is as recommended by the Town Services and Outreach Committee to adopt a safety zone in accordance with Mass General Law uh, Chapter 90, Paragraph 18B for the portion of Henry Street between Market Hill Road and Pine Street. Is there a second? Second, second Ernie. Oh, lots my of, God. Lots of us. <laughs> After all these years. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Man Mandy Jo. Um, a couple. <laughs> the The first question is, has the current 25 mile an hour in for, uh, speed limit that is posted now been enforced? Um, the engineering study said enforcement is one of the more crucial aspects of managing speeds. Um, and what the second question is, if we change it to 20, is there a plan to differently enforce it, more enforce it, more frequently enforce it? Like, will we change our enforcement methods to actually start enforcing? Um, uh, next question for TSO. Um, the engineering study said that traffic calming measures like speed cushions or raised mid-block crossings would be applicable for this street um, and that those are most effective at slowing drivers. And the engineering study said that the location could be eligible for high visibility walk crosswalks and associated signage. So did TSO talk about recommending any of that, especially since the engineering study indicated that um, without enforcement and this street that is relatively straight um, and, and that has no visual instructions generally encourage drivers to drive faster regardless of what the posted speed limit is. So it doesn't, it was their discussion about whether a posted speed limit change from 25 to 20 would actually make a difference without any other changes to the roads. And then finally, the engineering study along with the actual statute indicates that a safety zone should be a full quarter mile or more. Um, but the motion that was just put on the table is less than a quarter mile, according to the engineering study. The engineering study had said you can go an extra 300 feet south of Pine Street to get to the full quarter mile that safety zones under the statute are recommended. Is there a reason that the motion does not include the full quarter mile? Did TSO not recommend the full quarter mile? Is it legal to do it without a full quarter mile? Can we choose less than a full quarter mile? I know it's a lot of questions. Guilford. I'm going to leave you to answer the questions that you can, which don't deal with enforcement. Okay. So the recommendation I understood was for the full quarter mile. So I guess that is if we, if you just want to, if you can edit the motion when you make it. Um, so that should be what it is. Um, there was a lot of discussion about traffic calming. We brought that up quite a bit. Um, the TSO approved this as being a, a safety zone. So this this little area will go on into our design this fall and hopefully in the spring or sometime by the summer, we'll have worked out what the traffic calming will, we would want to see. Um, we also, the report says to move the parking lot to the daycare side of the property. We proposed that a couple of times and our so those are things that we will work out over the fall and winter and hopefully have a plan sometime next spring or summer for probably implementation if we can. Um, so that was discussed. So can I just ask with regard to the amending the motion, is it, would it be 300 feet south of Pine Street? Yes. Okay, thank you. 350 according 350 oh wait thank no hold you. on i didn't remember the number thank you no i you got i gotta find it in the engineering study yeah 300 feet 300 according to page three of the engineering study okay so i'm uh and I made the motion. I'm going to now ask, uh, just ask for a friendly amendment, which after the word and, it would say and 300 feet south of Pine Street. Is, and somebody seconded, is that acceptable? Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, I don't know that we have answers for the rest of your questions, Mandy Jo. Kathy. I, I just want to emphasize the other question Mandy asked because the original request was for a raised platform or speed hump, something like